Hello and welcome to the first session of Responsibility and Existential Risk. Entry anthropomorphism broadly construed is in vogue across contemporary theory and continental philosophy. The topic of human extinction is natural bedfellow. And yet, despite popularity alongside parallel proliferation of geological epochs, subtype pessimisms and various schools of tenebrosity, theoretical engagements with our future exploration emerging from critical post-humanism are often on closer introspection, so surprisingly uncritical. The conversation, in other words, is conceptually premature, considering one of the topics it holds most dear. As most as shall, as shall be explored during this four-part course, this is precisely due to the field's deep set and ongoing obsession with proliferation itself. Whether a voluminous difference, the muscular mindlessness of becoming, or the patchworks of swarming experimentation. Elsewhere, in entirely different quarters, the topic enjoys similar visibility, but for different reasons. This refers to the recent maturation of future studies in its cousin macro strategy and its focus on measuring and mitigating experiential risk in relation to humanity's long-term trajectories, pioneered by scholars from Bostrom to Silfovich, extinction threads have here become a target of an emerging field of quantitative, rigorous, and scientific serious study. In the seminar, we will address this latter as a counter to some aspects of the former, through an exploration of how it is that investigating our existential precarity is inseparable from acknowledging some basic responsibility for the activity we call thinking. Engaging themes from modality to city, the course will be, of, be, be suited to students interested in the philosophy of science and the history of philosophy. Thomas Moynihan is a researcher from the UK. He has just submitted his PhD at the University of Oxford focusing on intellectual history and existential risk. Through his work, he aims to supply a historical reflective dimension to the emerging field of future studies, elucidating its place within the wider history of ideas and contextualizing such frontiers of inquiry within the longest range dynamics of philosophical and cultural modernity. I will now give the mic to Thomas Moynihan. Hi there. Hey, can everyone hear me? Perfectly. Excellent. Good stuff. Um, cool. So, hi everyone. Uh, so, um, where shall I start? Uh, so, yeah, I would uh, I categorize what I do as a history of ideas, um, which means that you know I'm somewhat of a generalist, uh, which means I'm not a specialist in anything. So, I'm hoping to through these discussions, you know basically have you teach me as well. So uh, I'm hoping that we can kind of get a, a good exchange going. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, and also whenever uh, whenever I'm talking, uh, interrupt whenever, uh, if you have a question or a, a comment or anything um, of that kind. So uh, first, uh, I want you guys to uh, introduce yourselves to me. Um, I have spoken to some of you before, but uh, a lot of you I don't know. So um, if you could just uh, go through, um, uh, I'm sure Patrick knows the best way of doing this, but uh, go through and uh, you know, kind of introduce yourself, say a tiny bit about why you're interested uh, in this course. Um, and maybe you could say if you are concerned with human extinction, uh, yes or no. And, and, and if so, maybe say what you're concerned, uh, what kind of scenario you're concerned with, uh, what kind of risk you uh, think is most likely, uh, but only, only if you want to. So yeah, just uh, if you guys could uh, introduce yourself to me, that would be good. So I'll start with Jamine because Jamine is currently in a position where uh, it's best if she starts first, starts first, as I have understood. 
Uh, are you able to, to introduce yourself, Jamine? Otherwise, I will jump to Valentin. Okay, I'll jump to Valentin. Hello, Valentin. Please present yourself. Hello, I'm Valentin. We uh, have Jamine here. Right. Hi. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Hi, my name is Yamine, and I'm an artist. Um, Apologies for the noise. I'm in an Apple store getting my computer fixed. Um, I'm currently working on the future of the commons and how it intersects with aspirations for progress in the South, sort of the global South, particularly Pakistan, um, working in Karachi. And a sound project is underway uh, where we're studying coastal history. So I see that uh, Damina has dropped, and I think I'll go to Valentin. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Valentin. I study philosophy. I'm interested in uh, continental philosophy of, and I'm trying to make something like a continental philosophy of technology. Uh, and uh, the tragic events that await us and already uh, we already undergo concern me because i think there's going to be a lot of uh, suffering and it, it bothers me i'm not really concerned with complete extinction of humans but i'm concerned with the horrible way it will hit a lot of people everywhere so the next is michael Hello, Michael. Can you present yourself? Please. Um, Hi, my name is Michael. Um, I also study philosophy. Um, what I've been working on a lot recently is um, trying to do a kind of intellectual history of the concept of freedom in Western philosophy and trying to um, come up with a new way of thinking about it because I don't like really almost any of the ideas about it so far. Um, I think they all have something that they're lacking and I want to try to make something good out of them. Um, and I think the question of responsibility and how to deal with uncertainty and risk is like very, one of the primary questions that you'd have to be able to answer to give a good, um, like revised or new concept of what it might mean to be um, a free person in the world and like a, you know, in a society kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, that's me. Thanks a great lot. The next person in line is Matthew. Matthew, can you present yourself? Uh, hey guys, how's it going? Uh, my name is Matthew. I also study philosophy. I just finished my uh, my undergraduate uh, in Toronto, and I'll be going on to do uh, a master's in, in Montreal and Concordia. I might generally, I'm like kind of a generalist as well, so I kind of relate to that that feeling of like knowing a, a little bit about a lot of things. Um, but my research has generally fallen in uh, phenomenology, Merleau-Ponty. I've been thinking a lot about um, emotion and how emotion is related to cognition. I think this course interests me because I feel like I've always wondered whether humanity is, is old or young, like kind of where we, we kind of land on that, on that whole trajectory. Um, I don't know, again, I, I don't know if I'm totally concerned with like total extinction, but like the idea of like a lot, a complete loss of history, uh, is, is something that I, I, I find myself emotionally attached to. So, uh, looking forward to it. Thanks a great lot. Next person is James. Can you please present yourself? Hi, I'm James. Um, I'll be starting at the new school in the fall. Um, I'm interested in philosophy of science, particularly computation, bios, intelligence. And I'm really interested in um, critically investigating the emerging field of biological computing, like chemical computers, bacteria computers, this kind of thing. In terms of existential risk, my, my kind of critical instinct leads me to believe that some of the greatest risks might actually be suggested within the kind of axiologies, presuppositions, um, teleologies um, that are implicit 
in the risks that we discuss um, as we frame them. So I think that the way that we identify risk and the means by which we attempt to mitigate risk, these, if left unexamined, might actually pose the greatest dangers as we attempt to protect the things uh, particular to humankind that are actually the most destructive. So that's kind of my uh, approach. The next person is JP. Can you uh, present yourself? Hello, everybody. Well, I know some of you. Uh, yeah, I'm, my, my actual name is Jean-Pierre. I live in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I'm a philosopher and a musician or artist, for lack of a better word. Um, current, uh, current project is uh, uh, an investigation into scale sensitivity uh, in the sense of uh, examining the possibility of philosophy into uh, fashioning concepts that are scale sensitive and its relationship, of course, to sensibility as well. So of, uh, the existential risk theme is a very interesting way also to um, dramatize and to locate uh, uh, like a point wherein you know the concept and the possibility of recognition of something as you know grand as an existential risk this poses a lot of uh, interesting conceptual uh, questions as well so this is very interesting to me and regarding you know my emotions towards it i i don't really you have any sorry <laughs> i mean we, we for all i care we can i mean whatever <laughs> really <laughs> i'm much of a nihilist at this point so <laughs> love that uh, <laughs> next person in line is artemis can you please present yourself are uh, you somehow muted right. I can hear now. Always, always, <laughs> with the second time. My name is Artemis, I'm an architect. I'm currently in London. Um, it's uh, hard to position myself as my field is like really open and uh, it's always hard to <clears throat> indicate a specific uh, frame, let's say, uh, of the field of, or of my interest. I'm. Um, let's say also an artist because some things I create are not actually only architectural and uh, I'm here because I um, <clears throat> come, came into Thomas lecture it was the talk that we had uh, in uh, Berlin and I was fasc fascinated by it and I'm uh, really interested in uh, see how this unfolds in the seminar so I uh, decided to audit it <laughs> through the new center Yes. Thanks a great lot. Next person is Alex. Alex, can you please present yourself? Hi, um, I'm Alex. I guess I'm an autodidact with primary interests in uh, philosophy of science and epistemology. Um, and I guess I'm interested in this seminar largely because of uh, a, a more, I'm hoping that it will present a more philosophical, philosophically um, informed treatment of the concept of existential risk which I come from, I've spent a lot of time on the, the less wrong forums, which is where X risk was largely originally formulated as a concept. This is where uh, this guy Phil Torres, for instance, uh, comes from. And I think that the, um, the popular formalizations uh, um, or formulations of that concept that exist in people like Bostrom and people coming from the less wrong community are extremely faulty due to a number of uh, quite bad presuppositions about things like probability and risk and uh, about the sort of drives um, that are latent within intelligence, how intelligence ought to be construed. So um, yeah, I'm quite skeptical. But um, I guess more broadly, I, I am kind of like uh, Jean-Pierre in that I don't care that much about existential risk for humans as a whole. But I mean, I'd say that life itself is an existential risk if we uh, uh, take Heidegger at his word. Um, so I'll leave it at that. This was the full class, so I'm back to new topics. 
Excellent. Cool. Thanks for uh, thanks everyone. Um, so yeah, I, it seems like a really interesting uh, and wide ranging group here. So I'm really happy about that. Um, so so yeah, like there's a lot of different angles um, uh, and a lot of different fields. So that yeah, hopefully we'll have some really good uh, conversations going forward. Um, so yeah, for me, um, I used to come from that kind of position of being like, you know, I couldn't care less, um, uh, and I don't think it's an Ill illegitimate position, but uh, I now do care, um, and hopefully throughout the course, uh, you'll kind of uh, maybe realize the reasons why, even if you do, even if you don't end up agreeing with me. Um, <clears throat> so for me, I actually um, it's interesting concerning uh, what you study, James. Um, I actually worry about uh, synthetic biology the most. I think that probably is uh, one of the bigger risks, um, just insofar as it's the most likely technology to first be kind of disseminated um, to individual actors and agents uh, that could potentially create a humanity killing um, scenario. So, you know, like, a you know, 3D printed pathogens and stuff like that. Uh, so once you get that kind of that kind of level of technology um, kind of de deputed to individual actors, uh, you have quite a big problem on your hands. Uh, you know, it's a once the cat is out of the bag scenario, I think. Uh, so, yeah, Martin Rees uh, once said, uh, can the global village cope with its global idiots, uh, especially when even one could be too many? Uh, so. That's what I worry about. But yeah, anyway, so, um, right. So at the very beginning, uh, I just want to give away some sense of what I'm trying uh, to do here, uh, to show my hand, so to speak. Um, so my intellectual historical work on recollecting the story of how we came to care about extinction as a species uh, has a meta-historical goal. Uh, it is an attempt to uh, explore the rationality of history through the history of rationality. Um, an attempt to eke out what I like to call the pragmatic indivisibility of retrospection and prospection in sapient activity. Um, and what I mean by this is basically that it's because we have a history that we can so much as even begin to care about our future. And so hopefully across the course we can explore what that means. Uh, but in a nutshell, uh, history gives us values and history's revolutions force us to uh, undertake progressively greater responsibility for said values, uh, which in turn forces us to become uh, anticipatory and to preemptively protect and redoubt them against the rolling revolutions of, uh, you know, of, of modern time. Uh, and this demand uh, for redoubting our values drags our anticipatory purview deeper and deeper into the future. Uh, so this is what I mean uh, by the idea of what it means to give a prehistory to prescience, um, which is kind of the overarching theme of this course. Um, and it's also what I mean when I say that we have been being swept up in the future for quite some time now. Uh, and ultimately recalling how we came to be swept up uh, by concern for the future across history may give us an idea of where we ought to be headed within it. Um, note the ought there. So yeah, um, here's the kind of basic idea uh, is uh, the idea is that we came to care about the future precisely when we realized our place in it is precarious. Uh, so that's the kind of, you know, spoiler, that's like the story that's going to kind of uh, be elaborated throughout these uh, sessions. Um, so today I'm going to go over the overarching narrative uh, in its kind of broad sweeps uh, and go into some of the historical detail. Uh, and in the next sessions, we're going to get into the more philosophical uh, and theory level kind of nitty gritty. Um, so today is the kind of the overview and the history session. Um, so yeah, right, first off, um, let's start at the very basics. Uh, so what is an existential risk? Um, so as I'm sure most of you know, uh, Nick Bostrom first defined it in a paper um, two years after the millennium. So maybe that's a pretentious date. Um, so yeah, in the paper he uh, said, uh, quote, 
An existential risk is one that threatens the premature extinction of Earth-originating intelligent life, or the permanent and drastic destruction of its potential for desirable future development. Um, Okay, so we can instantly see uh, one interesting contour of the concept here. Um, all extinctions are existential risks, but not all existential risks are extinctions. So note that there is already an axiological component here. Um, axiological just means to do with value. Um, so this is something too that we'll return to again and again throughout. Um, so in as much as it is to do with value, uh, existential risk is not just about mere survival. Uh, so yeah, there are scenarios um, envisaged where human humanity goes on surviving for a very long time, but shorn of all worth. Uh, one of these is what Bostrom calls a singleton society, um, which is a totalitarian government that effectively becomes permanently entrenched and irreplaceable via utter technical dominance. Um, the idea being that that would kind of stop uh, progression construed as, you know, in Bostrom's framework and this kind of trans uh, transhumanist um, kind of uptick. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, there are also like hellish scenarios uh, which are caused by, you know, super intelligences and nefarious simulators. Uh, so if anyone's familiar with Rocco's Basilisk, that's an obvious example. Uh, so these are fates that are worse than extinction. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, this instantly lets us know that existential risk is not just about mere survival. Uh, so, um, my core proposal uh, is basically this, uh, it is because we can care about thriving uh, or following the better reason uh, that we can so much as even begin to think about our surviving as a species, uh, which is to say that prognostic concern for extinction is a rational activity or something that only rational animals can engage in. Uh, from here, you can kind of see the gambit of the course as redressing post-humanism uh, and the kind of um, ruin porn for the human race that you get at the moment from certain circles therein. Um, <clears throat> anyway, our ability to so much as even think about extinction is not an occasion, uh, I argue, to mindlessly celebrate tentacular differences beyond the human, to rave about Cthulhu scenes and the like, or to announce yet more postmodern decenterings of the human. Uh, no, uh, thinking about extinction and acknowledging its severity is the summons to a tenacious task uh, that, if we follow correctly, may just lead us to manufacture something better than us, as those that came before us uh, manufactured us. So that's the core, bam core gambit. Um, because we're animals that care, can care about thriving, we're animals that can so much as even care for our surviving uh, and care here in the sense of putting a value on it and thus be collectively motivated to predict, prognose, strategize, uh, rather than merely care in the sense of being pressured by fear response or instinctual uh, inheritance. Uh, so yeah, non-human animals no doubt care about survival, uh, evidently so. Um, but this is taking care in a very ecumenical sense of the term. Uh, they clearly don't do it in the same way that we do, uh, because you know they don't have uh, planetary forecast. Uh, anyway, so yeah, um, this is what takes us to the history of the thought of existential risks. Uh, so recalling the history of how we came to care, came to care and think about such risks establishes that it was through reason and rational elaboration alone that we came to think about such things in the first place. Um, it establishes that actuarial concern for prospective extinction is a crowning achievement of distinctively modern rationality. Um, it was not a victory of scientific empiricism alone, but simultaneously one of distinctively philosophical modernity. Um, so as, as we shall investigate, um, we first came to care about existential precarity during the Enlightenment. Um, this was due to the contemporaneous consolidation of various new fields of empirical science and their new ways of describing the natural and factual world. Uh, these were namely uh, the earth sciences, probabilism, um, population science. Uh, we will explore each of these a little bit later on. Um, but at the same time, coming to care about our extinction during this era uh, in the sense of articulating its axiological stakes 
involved uh, not only empirical investigations, but in tandem reflections upon the placement and precarity of the framework within which all empirical investigation must take place. Uh, in other words, uh, and to put it slightly more clearly maybe, um, it was part and parcel of a larger movement uh, beginning at the very entrance of advanced modernity in the late Middle Ages uh, that involved not only empirical inquiry into brute facts, but also in-step reflections upon the positionality and propriety of value within a universe consequently revealed to be utterly unresponsive to our values and demands. Uh, as I like to say, uh, historical thought about existential precarity is always tacitly reflective first, only acquiring declarative content and empirical level determination afterwards. Uh, that is to say, anticipatory and descriptive prognostication upon what we now call existential risk emerges across history from the long-term loss of the ancient conviction that we live in a universe inherently imbued with value and judicial structure. Uh, this loss defines the move from the ancient world to the modern world. Um, and the German, the German philosopher Hans Blumenberg uh, called this the Ordnungsschwund, uh, or the loss of a ju jurisprudential cosmos. Uh, this was key to our oncoming reception to the idea that we could die out as a species because prior to modernity and throughout the ancient world, um, people simply presumed that because it was the nature of the universe to be maximally full, as maximally full of value as possible, then if we were to die out, we would either inevitably return precisely because it is the na very nature of the universe to be as full of as sapient value as is possible, or it wouldn't matter precisely because the universe is elsewise filled with infinitely many other beings that are exactly like us or are axiologically equitable or superior. So in the cosmos of the ancients, which is a universe filled with maximal value, extinction could not, uh, it could not have any stakes. Um, it simply could not become so much as even thinkable. Um, so put differently, in a universe maximally imbued with meaningfulness, there can be no end to meaning, such that human extinction could have no sting. Uh, and without a sting, or appreciation of the stakes involved, there was no motivation to even begin to think about it, um, let alone set up, you know, planetary forecast or fund future of humanity institutes. Um, so, we first had to lose this naive conviction, um, and the loss of this conviction culminated in the Enlightenment, of course. Uh, it was suitable then that this was the age that explicitly defined itself as humanity's progressive undertaking of responsibility for itself. This is suitable because loss of this age-old conviction that sapience is infinitely cradled within an infin infinitely hospitable universe is precisely coincident with our acknowledgement that we alone are entirely accountable for the entirety of the activity we call mind. Um, this acknowledgement is at the very heart of what Kant called the maturation of the human race or our collective emergence from knowledge uh, and immurement and immaturity. Um, so as an aside here, uh, taking the enlightenment on its own triumphalist terms can concern people um, and this is very understandable, um, the universalist goals set forth by the Enlighteners, was, the Enlighteners sorry, um, were smeared by their own racist, androcentric, etc., failure to live up to these, these ideals. Uh, however, thinking that this renegs the contentfulness of such universalist goals reveals a misunderstanding of exactly what a regulative ideal or motivating standard is. Um, motivating ideals, that is, uh, not arbitrated, accepted or rejected by merely the maximality or minimality of their real world actualization, but rather by their internal coherence and legitimacy. Uh, so Enlightenment universalism failed precisely because it wasn't universal enough, um, and failing the first time is no indictment against keeping on trying. Uh, so. The story of how we came to care about extinction is a story about enlightenment in the sense of the historical period of the 18th century, during which we de facto first came to think about such prognostic prospects. Uh, but it is also a story about enlightening in an altogether more fundamental, dramatic and meaningful sense. And this is the sense of enlightening as an ongoing and unfinished task, 
this is enlightenment considered de facto, not de facto, but de jure. Um, and what I mean by this is that re recollecting how we first came to care about extinction shows that today's efforts at X risk mit mitigation and so called macro strategy um, can be seen as emerging from a task that we first began to set ourselves in the Enlightenment. Uh, they are precisely continuations of this tenacious task that we first uh, undertook two centuries ago, um, which of course was Kant's idea of the progressive undertaking of responsibility for the human race. Um, and my argument is that, you know, should we choose to answer its summons, we are all inheritors of such a product, project. Uh, so yeah, uh, the, uh, ca casting current day mitigation efforts uh, and you know inquiry and research into X risk uh, as arising from out of this broad and progressive historical upswell is not only edifying, although it certainly is, uh, but it also helps justify present day research into X risks and macro strategy. Um, in other words, recollecting the history of how we came to care about extinction helps firmly establish why we should continue to care and care now as never before, insofar as our century is by all accounts going to be the riskiest thus far. So again, uh, Martin Rees, the uh, astronomer royal, um, he lately announced that he thinks, uh, and you know, he's quite a knowledgeable person on these topics, uh, he said that our odds of making it out of the incumbent century are 50-50. Um, and uh, so yeah, the stakes are, pretty large. Um, <clears throat> so recollecting on how we came to care helps establish why we should continue to care. That's my claim here. Um, and once again, this is nothing but explicating the intertwinement of retrospection and prospection uh, in the acti activities of creatures um, like us who are at least in some part the product of their own making. Um, again, it might seem perverse, or it might not to some of you, uh, it might seem perverse to say that we need to establish why we need to care about human extinction. Uh, it would certainly seem self-evident to many, and especially those working in X-risk uh, mitigation and the less wrong crowd. Um, but, you know, given that anti anti-anthropocentrism is abroad at the moment, um, it's actually not so self-evident in wider discussions. Um, and here, I, I'm not claiming that, you know, post-humanist pessimism uh, and continental and humanism is the main problem in this department. Uh, I'm not, you know, going to do a Jordan Peterson and say that um, postmodern university types are destroying the human race. Um, but there is a general malaise and nihilism uh, in the air far beyond the academy. Um, so, yeah, in the book that I put on the reading list for this week uh, by Phil Tors, he he quotes a debate.org. Um, uh, questionnaire which said you know if you're presented with a button to destroy humanity would you push it and 79 percent of people uh, said yes so you know obviously a debate.org uh, survey isn't an objective cross-section but um, in you know the global village we only need one uh, honest participant and the right technology for you know to have a real problem on our hands um, <clears throat> so you know that's why I'm trying to say what you know that's kind of trying to justify this idea of uh, the history of this idea. Um, so again, by recollecting how we came to care about extinction, we can see that it's part and parcel of humanity's undertaking of responsibility for itself. Uh, and insofar as this undertaking remains an ongoing and unfinished task, it helps to reinforce why we should continue to care and care now as never before. Um, so to put this differently, it establishes that forecast and anticipatory protection of Homo sapiens is something that we do for edifying reasons rather than mere causal pressures. Uh, in other words, basically, I'm trying to establish that it is the right thing to do. Um, and so, you know, caring about existential risk is, an act is a rational activity, uh, but I'm trying to say that it is one of the most rational activities. Um, you know, it is to answer the summons of the vocation of mankind, to put it in lofty phrase phraseology that I'm uh, taking from Fichte here. <clears throat> so, to sum up, um, thinking about how we came to care about extinction helps reaffirm that caring about our survival is and remains the right thing to do going forward. Um, it provides a legitimating impetus to contemporary anticipation, basically. Um, and again, this is important because there's a whole uh, 
there's a whole species of existential risk defined as agential risks. Um, and these are ones that we have inflict upon ourselves as a commons. Um, and they come from misalignment and disagreement from what is what even is the right thing to do. Uh, so, you know, you think about a Unabomber in a world with 3D printable viruses. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is why I describe you know this recollection of uh, the history of how we came to care about extinction as overt history as covert future proofing um or the idea that through retrospection we provide a resilient uh, prospectus uh, an edifying impetus going forward um or again it's just this idea of the pragmatic indivisibility of retrospection and prospection um another way i like to put this is that Futurology without axiology is blind, and axiology is confirmed only through precedential appraisal. Um, so, just to get into a little bit of the um, the uh, the detail of the history, um, uh, let's have a look at some of the first um, prognostications upon human extinction, the first explicit ones uh, as they emerged throughout the uh, the century of the Enlightenment. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, one of the first examples, uh, actually, they emerge as far back as the 1720s, um, surprisingly or unsurprisingly enough. Uh, so one of the first ones comes from uh, this really eccentric French diplomat called uh, Benoit de Malais, who was kind of one of the first people to propose something that looked a bit like evolution. Um, I say a bit like because it, it's, yeah, it's, it's a strange theory. But um, he worried in this book where he proposed this kind of proto-evolutionary theory. He worried about what would happen if our Earth, uh, if the sun died and our Earth then kind of drifted off into cold space. Um, so then, you know, you get the first, you get the first uh, identifiably modern ideas of extinction scenarios from the 1720s onwards. So, you know, later uh, in 1754, uh, David Hume um, proclaimed that, quote, man equally with every animal and vegetable will eventually partake in extirpation, unquote. Um, two years later, uh, the massively influential French naturalist, uh, Georges Buffon, uh, pondered upon what life form would inherit our crown as apex cogitator uh, should uh, the human species be annihilated, as he said. Um, he also actually theorized uh, that the Earth would one day refrigerate uh, due to terminal heat dissipation uh, and calculated a span of um, uh, 168,000 years until this uh, kind of irreversible end of terrestrial activity. Um, so, you know, he was preempting Clausius's uh, form formulation of entropy almost a century beforehand, uh, and in doing so, was the first person to put, like, very clear time asymmetry into natural history. Uh, prior to this, the, all the models of natural history were very cyclical. Um, and we'll kind of explore that a little bit later on. Um, so, uh, yeah, by the 1780s, uh, you get um, kind of uh, the idea get, starts to kind of percolate into uh, literary um, uh, thought experiments. Um, and around this time, you actually get the Marquis de Sade uh, characteristically, you know, saying nothing would be more desirable than the total extinction of mankind. Um, and this is actually the first time that I've found that anyone's actually said this. Uh, so, you know, yeah, uh, not necessarily a surprise that it comes from Saad. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, after this, you get uh, the first major um, speculative fictions, um, and imaginative fictions on the topic coming from the second generation romantics. Um, Byron's poem, uh, Darkness, in 1816, uh, extrapolates the sterilization of our biosphere by way of heat dissipation again. Um, then by, the, by 1819, you get Schopenhauer. Uh, he propose, proposes his ascetic uh, antinatalist maxism, maxim and then uh, you know, extrapolates from that and says, well, explicitly says that if his maxim becomes universal, um, the human race would die out. Uh, and uh, after that, you get a, he's a similar figure to Schopenhauer, but less well known, um, uh, Italian pessimist poet philosopher named uh, Giacomo Leopardi. He produces a whole bunch of work um, predicting and uh, exploring the idea of human extinction. 
Uh, and then by the 1840s, you get this uh, interesting figure, Vladimir Odaevsky is a Russian print, uh, and he was the first person to predict that humanity would kill itself via its own technological development. Um, so yeah, we're going to return to him a little bit later on, uh, and also the uh, beginnings of um, something that I call omnicidal reason uh, around this time in the mid 19th century, uh, which is just philosophies that exhort our suicide, our species suicide. Um, so we might think that these kind of philosophies are quite contemporary to our own present moment, uh, but they actually go back um, basically as far as you know uh, the 1850s uh, and yeah, well Schopenhauer even. Um, so yeah, uh, this gives us a rough like uh, chronological sense of uh, how it was that sensitivity to existential precarity uh, entered and spread across public consciousness throughout the age of reason. Um, but to turn to the causes behind this, um, I've already mentioned that it was due to the emergence of various new fields of empirical science. Um, and I've also already mentioned that it was consequent upon philosophical reflections upon the nature of value itself. Um, so what I mean by these reflections is basically, you know, the master idea of the enlightenment. Uh, and this was the realization which of course reached its fullest explication in Kant's critical revolution. Uh, the idea that values and maxims that we elect to bind ourselves by and are thus not at all part of the natural world beyond this election. Uh, this was basically the full realization that such values are not at all to be considered part of the furniture of the natural world, independently of our stewardship and upholding of them, uh, which in turn made us realize that they are entirely our responsibility and thus demand our unceasing protection and vigilant guardianship. Um, so put differently, minded creatures alone are culpable for the fate of mind. Uh, and it's my argument is that Kant was the person that allowed us to kind of fully uh, realize this. Um, <clears throat> And so it was through this enlightenment philosophical discovery about value um, that we realized that, you know, it was, it's because sapience is astronomically precarious that it is also astronomically precious. And through realizing this, we were summoned, uh, first summoned to the uh, modernity defining projects of foresight, mitigation, strategizing. Um, uh, it was this that first motivated us to care about our extinction uh, and motivated us to redoubt justice uh, and judicial value against an extrajudicial nature. Um, so, so yeah, this is, you know, this is what first led us to care about our extinction. Um, and it is why the first explicit prognostications on the matter emerge throughout the period explored. Um, and basically it incepted a dynamic that ever since has continued to drag our concerns further and further into a horizon of futurity. Um, so I call, I call this future orientation uh, and, you know, think that modernization can be defined itself as an ongoing increase in such future orientation. Um, and I think that it's within this, you know, long durational context of the emergence of future orientation across uh, across modernity that we should you know contextualize the very recent maturation of inquiry into existential risks and future studies more generally um <clears throat> so it's a really good example of just to make it kind of concrete a really good example of this incremental future orientation um it, it is the fact that you know now by way of anthropogenic climate change our horizon of culpability extends to indefin indefinitely many potential future generations. Um, and taking this even further, you know, Nick Bostrom argues that there is an opportunity cost uh, involved in delaying space colonization efforts. Uh, the idea being that we're jeopardizing the potential for trillions of potential future lives by remaining upon this one brittle planet. Um, the implication being that, you know, multi-planet species have kind of uh, existential redundancy built in. Um, <clears throat> so, so yeah, this, this dynamic of incremental future orientation can be seen to begin sometime around the Enlightenment, um, or what the German historian Reinhard Kosselet called the Sattelzeit, 
which is basically just the, the period in which we first began to be concerned with futurity. Um, and, you know, it was here that in realizing the stakes involved in our project as a species, we were first dragged further and further into the future, um, or at least our concerns were. Um, so here is the basic upshot. Uh, it was only by fully extracting value from facts or coming to desacralize the universe that we first became, first came to properly care about the prospective fact of the end of value. Uh, it was only through this realization that culminated in Kant uh, that we progressively realized and still continue to realize the stakes involved in the activity we call thinking uh, and eventually came to realize that these stakes are properly existential. Uh, and it was only through realizing these stakes that we were again uh, first motivated to predict and preempt. Uh, and this, though it, you know, though it's essentially a semantic discovery, which we're going to explore next week, um, it is in fact the, the veritable genesis of you know present the present day's concrete planetary apparatus of long-term foresight and mitigation. So, um, yeah, is is this dynamic that defines our ongoing tendency to be swept up in the future? Um, for ever since we you know, realize that we're culpable for the entire fate of mind, we have become increasingly conversant with increasingly distal and increasingly severe threats. And I think there's a direct relationship there. Uh, so yeah, um, another way of putting all that is just to say, you know, ever since the enlightenment, we incrementally acknowledge that we must reason ever better because should we not, we may never reason ever again. Uh, and this is quite a basic Kantian insight just stretched out across history. Um, the idea being there is no objective description without normative assessment. So because thinking is always a doing, it is true that there is no thinking about the world without articulation of the stakes involved in thinking thusly. Uh, again, we think ever better precisely because we worked out that if we don't, we may never think again. Um, and this is why caring about existential risks is in many ways a crowning achievement of modernity and the human project uh, is how we as a species undertook responsibility for ourselves again. Um, and, you know, this as ever is an ongoing and unfinished task. Uh, you know, one need only look at the kind of continued injustices and massive recklessness on display today. Uh, but as mentioned above, you know, uh, this does not at all make the task or the content of the task uh, illegitimate. So our current failings don't make the goal, um, you know, contentless. Uh, so just to sum up all of that so far, um, the, the story of how we came to care about our extinction is a story about enlightening in the sense of an unfinished project rather than a bygone and finished era, because it is a story about humanity's progressive undertaking of responsibility for itself. And because this undertaking is as yet unfinished, recollecting its inception is also a summons to keep at it. Um, <clears throat> cool. OK, so with all of that backdrop in tow um, and a taste of what's to come and what the overarching kind of uh, stakes are, um, I want to uh, fast forward to the present day and try and see how all of this historical backdrop fits in with the current discourse. Uh, so again, start with very basics. Why does the fact of our extinction matter? Um, so I think it's best to try and see questions like this within what could be called an astrobiological perspective or astrobiological context. Um, so one a good example of this is um, the uh, astrophysicist Adam Frank says that we should see the Anthropocene in this context. Um, he says that it's unlikely that it's the first time that a species has uh, or civilization has produced such an event. Um, his argument being that since biospheres and uh, geospheres co-evolve or interact with each other, uh, this is relevant for SETI uh, or search for extra extraterrestrial intelligence um, because other civilizations would influence their planets uh, in the same way and this is relevant for detection profiles. So that's just an example of how, you know, the kind of things that are going on here right now should maybe we should maybe begin to see them in this wider kind of uh, astrobiological cosmological context so i think that we can frame the question of extinction in this way uh, and of course many many other people already have um, but this 
leads uh, to the paper that I put on the reading list uh, by Charles Lineweaver, uh, who's also a, plan he's a planetary scientist and a cosmologist. Um, <clears throat> it's a humorous and insightful paper. Uh, um, the you know human-like intelligence is uh, not a convergent feature of evolution is is, is the title, uh, and in it yeah he argues that he argues against the presumption that biospheres will reliably re-evolve intelligent life. He argues for this by rallying insights from the history of evolution here on Earth. Uh, so in this same tradition, um, the evolutionary scientist Stephen Jay Gould uh, once talked about rerunning the tape on terrestrial evolution. And following such thought experiments, he concluded that, quote, Homo sapiens is an entity, not a tendency, unquote. So he said simply that if we re-ran re evolution's tape, uh, we wouldn't happen again. Um, and Lineweaver takes a similar stance. Uh, he says that intelligence is a fluke rather than a convergent point. Um, and this is obviously relevant for SETI because if sapient life is a quirk here, it is likely a quirk everywhere. Um, so, so anyway, yeah, Lineweaver's basic argument is that intelligence is not a convergent feature of evolution. And he stresses that, you know, subsequent convergence in evolution is only as strong as prior divergence. Uh, so the fact that intelligent behaviors have evolved separately uh, across different terrestrial lineages here on Earth is not necessarily as significant as some people claim it is. In t when, when they're arguing for the fact that, you know, you get intelligence is uh, uh, reliably elsewhere. Um, and he also uh, shows that reconstructing a lineage leading up to an exaggerated feature can distort said feature into a tendency rather than an entity. Um, so this is where he talks about encephalization quotients. So um, encephalization quotient is just a way of measuring uh, and comparing brain-body ratios across species. Uh, so increasing encephalization quotient, or EQ, across the fossil record uh, is often rallied as a sign that intelligence is a convergent tendency of evolution. Uh, however, Lineweaver shows that you know elephants could just as easily construct a nasalization quotient and proudly discern elaborate trunks as you know the tendentious point of evolution. Um, so <clears throat> anyway, so yeah, all this is all convincingly put forward by Lineweaver. Uh, however, all this stuff remains incredibly hotly debated, um, and there are some there are plenty of convincing arguments in the opposite direction. I'm not at all qualified to uh, argue one way or the other. Um, so I'm raising it for the very specific reason uh, concerning the mere thinkability that the universe doesn't reliably and recurrently produce intelligences like ourselves. Um, so I, you know, I'm just raising it to say that this, is not, this option is very much on the table. And this, uh, of course, is where um, the Fermi paradox comes in. Uh, which is, you know, kind of idea that I want to hold in the background throughout these uh, sessions and throughout our conversations. Um, so, you know, wh whether or not one thinks intelligence would be a convergent and recurrent feature of evolution, not only on our biosphere, but far beyond, uh, you know, there are a few basic things to consider in light of uh, this, this uh, the, the, the Fermi paradox. So, uh, you know, first and most importantly, our planet is a relative latecomer on the cosmic scene. So. As the uh, astrobiologist um, Milan Serkovic writes, uh, quote, uh, the first habitable planets emerged in the Milky Way more than nine billion years ago. Um, this does seem to be enough time for a hypothetical civilization arising on those first planets a couple of billion years later. Um, so because we're late on the cosmic scene, we have this vast uh, time before us where it seems plausible that life should have, could have, emerged uh, and developed into something that we should be able to see. Uh, and yet we don't. We don't see any evidence. We haven't yet seen any evidence of intentional activity. Uh, no grand feats of astro engineering, no superstructures, no spacefaring civilizations. Uh, and the idea behind all this is that, you know, a suitably elderly civilization would actually become very visible. Um, you know, it would start using its star as an energy source, Dyson sphere, uh, these kind of ideas. Um, but, you know, we haven't seen any evidence of this, not only in our galaxy, but within our entire light cone, uh, which, you know, is somewhat troubling, implying, you know, perhaps that no one actually gets this far. 
Uh, so, you know, regardless of whether one strongly thinks intelligence is convergent or recurrent uh, in, 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 you know, evolution in this astrobiological context, uh, the silence of the skies should at least make us, you know, sensitive to the fact that we cannot take it for granted that we are in a universe vastly populated with advanced and rational agents like ourselves. Uh, and this is what I mean when I say that we, you know, we shouldn't sit on our Copernican laurels. Um, so we, we simply, you know, we, we cannot simply and nonchalantly just presume that is the nature of our factual universe to create values. Uh, this is not an intuition earned by the observations at hand. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the matter is knotty, however, because there are two connotations of Copernicanism. Uh, and each one produces very different intuitions on the matter. So one connotation I call uh, non-exceptionality and the other unresponsiveness. Um, so Copernicanism is unexceptionality is behind the notion that our planet isn't the exception because there are multitudes of similar ones. Uh, whereas by contrast, Copernicanism is unresponsivity is behind the idea that widest nature is not at all responsive to what we as rational creatures demand or hold valuable. Um, so, you know, historically, Copernicanism has had these kind of s somewhat separate, uh, you know, li intellectual lineages. Um, so, you know, losing the Ptolemaic worldview was never merely a question of spatiality in the sense of the kind of unexceptional uh, strand, but it was also a question of axiology in the sense of the unresponsivity strand because the Ptolemaic worldview was you know, not only a spatial format, but a, a moral uh, layout as well. So, you know, both strands of uh, Copernicanism decenter, but in very different ways. Uh, so, you know, following the former, we'd, uh, following the unexception, un unexceptionality idea, we'd expect, you know, sapient and value mongering intelligences like our own to be very common throughout the universe. Uh, following the latter, you know, one realizes that we should maybe be very precautious with such presumptions. Uh, so, you know, once again, we cannot just presume that the, it is the nature of the universe to reliably create value. Uh, you know, the silence of the skies um, is reason enough to hold this into account. Uh, and so, you know, this is integral. The reason why I bring this up is it's integral to the question of existential risk and existential precarity insofar as, you know, historically speaking, the idea that the universe was interminably populated with infinitely many intelligences is the root of the age-old prohibition upon understanding the stakes and the prospects of our extinction. So, uh, <clears throat> to just tell a little story here, um, I gave a talk recently on, you know, the intellectual history of human extinction, and one of the audience members came up to me afterwards and said, uh, you know, don't you think that uh, if we were to die out today, uh, you know, the, the planet would, Earth would uh, just create another intelligent species in a, you know, a couple of million years or however long. Uh, in, in, you know, in the distant future, there will be other intellectual historians like yourself to like worry about human extinction and everything will be done again. And so, you know, this is, this is what um, Lineweaver calls the planet of the apes hypothesis. Uh, and you know it's important regarding the axiological severity of the fact of our extinction. Um, so you know the person that asked me this was incredibly incredibly incisive because they got to the very heart of the matter. But I think that you know they're gravely wrong to endorse and entertain such a kind of existential nonchalance. Um, <clears throat> so you know, um, can I raise a quick question about that? Yeah, of course. Um, isn't another alternative? that's also deeply troubling just as much as the planet of the apes hypothesis not so much the idea that we'll come back again in some other form but rather that we don't need to ever come back because we're going to heaven or something like that and we're going to be piecing out of this world and it doesn't matter anymore yeah 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 i mean a hundred percent definitely so uh so that kind of um nonchalance yeah, there are two forms of nonchalance. There's the kind of naturalistic one that's, you know, intelligence will just reemerge. And then there's the other one that's, you know, even more encompassing uh, and historically uh, old, uh, almost like the default kind of mindset um, 
is this idea that yeah, uh, you know, the kind of theistic framework just doesn't allow any stakes. Um, I mean, I'm actually, you know, it's, it's this, this is a as a distinction between uh, apocalypse and extinction, basically. That's you know, um, it, apocalypse means that we can kind of rest assured knowing that nothing was ever at stake because you know the ultimate meaning of time will eventually be revealed uh whereas extinction you know sh tells us that everything that we ever have held de held dear has always been in jeopardy um because there is the prospect of meaning actually being terminated within time so you know it's not that time is infinitely meaningful it's rather that you know, meaning can actually be extinguished in time. Um, so yeah, that's yeah, entirely entirely true. Is that you know people couldn't think about extinction for most of history because of the theistic framework. Um, and I'm bringing up the Planet of the Apes hypothesis because there's a continuation that's um, de de theolo theologist, you know, whatever the verb for that would be. Uh, you know, uh, it's not so much religious, but it still maintains this mingling of normativity and nature that basically prohibits us from articulating the stakes. Um, so it's not the apocalyptic framework, it's this kind of framework of return. Um, so yeah, we're, you know, <clears throat> we'll come back again and again to that. But yeah, that's actually, I mean, yeah, perfectly correct. Yeah, that, that, that um, you know, the uh, religious framework does also prohibit uh, any kind of care or concern uh, for extinction. Uh, I mean, unsurprisingly so, right? Um, so yeah, j you know, to, to get back to the Planet of the Apes thing, it's, uh, um, Bostrom uh, writes uh, in the introduction to his book on global catastrophic risk, he actually writes exactly on this, on this idea. Um, and he says, uh, yeah, <clears throat> quote, if some cataclysmic event were to destroy Homo sapiens and other higher organisms on Earth tomorrow, there does appear to be a window of opportunity of approximately one billion years uh, and this is based on, uh, you know, expansion of our sun and um, those kind of processes. Um, there is this window of opportunity of approximately one billion years for another intelligent species to evolve and take over where we left off. For comparison, it took approximately 1.2 billion years from the rise of sexual reproduction and simple multicellular organisms for the biosphere to evolve into its current state, and only a few million years for our species to evolve from its anthropoid ancestors." Unquote. Um, however, he then goes on to say, quote, of course, there is no guarantee that a rerun of evolution would produce anything like a human or a self-aware successor species, unquote. So, uh, you know, intelligence of some kind of, again, ecumenical definition may or may not be astrobiologically common. Uh, and can, we're only can, I, can, I, can I ask a question here? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious about, like, like how these conversations about astrobiology interact with like the idea of the limits of knowability, right? Because it kind of seems like when we're talking about intelligence and like modeling it on 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 ourselves, basically, we kind of limit our understanding of like what it could mean for an organism to become self-aware. Um, and it seems like in a in the context of the total universe, when we only have so much to go off of in terms of our own kind of biosphere that we start to like. It, like it could could it be totally possible that there are you know beings made of lead living on an entirely different planet which would have no interest in like uh, leaving their planet for any reason at all you know what I mean and so that in terms of the Fermi par like paradox it seems like that that kind of thing seems potentially possible yeah yeah a hundred percent so um, I mean this is one of the really interesting things about SETI from a philosophical point of view is that um, it's as much a reflection on us as it is an exploration about aliens. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it requires some definition of what intelligence is. And you're completely right uh, and correct that, you know, um, I mean, there's, a, there's an interesting paper on this. Um, I forget who wrote it, but it's called Astrocognition. And it's about the idea of what, uh, you know, the, the, the beginning of this kind of philosophical perspectives of like, you know, what does, co what is cognition in the most uh, kind of, you know, cosmological um, uh, d definition? So, you know, it's, there, there, are, there are definite conversations about this, yeah. 
Um, and so, yeah, there, there may well be animals, you know, uh, animals, um, you know, systems uh, made out of lead that don't care about interstellar exploration. But so, so one of the things, and I'm, you know, there probably are, who knows, but like one of the things um, that's interesting in the Fermi paradox, and this is one of the things that Sirkovic talks about um, very, in a very illuminating way, is one of the ways that we should assess um, uh, explanations for the paradox is this thing called the principle of non-exclusivity. Um, so given the sheer amount of exoplanets and this massive kind of prelude of time, uh, of you know, nine billion years um, in which terrestrial planets could have been made and other, other life forms start going down this path, um, you have this massive selection. So any explanation has to account for all of them uh, because just one, if just one had become a, like a spacefaring um, or like, you know, a, a spacefaring or sufficiently advanced civilization, it would become very visible. So the fact that, you know, the fact that we don't see any, it means that your explanation has to cover all instances. So for example, like one of the really popular original uh, explanations of the Fermi paradox was like nuclear bombs. It's like, oh, you know, any sufficiently advanced civilization, uh, you know, nukes itself to death. Uh, and, you know, m many of them may, may well do that. And, uh, but it's not, it's not, it, it has a problem with the non exclusivity thing there because, you know, uh, does that cover all cases? Um, so, like, one of the, a good example for one that is, um, that does cover this is uh, that talk about um, self-replicating von Neumann probes. Um, so, because if you create a swarm of self-replicating von Neumann probes that would go around, you know, the galaxy, killing life, like intelligent life forms, that actually only requires one place for it to begin, and then it covers everywhere. Um, so they're probably just coming to us right now, anyway. So yeah, <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's. Uh, yeah, the, the, these these questions are yeah really interesting. Um, I have a question. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So this is about the intelligence niche in the in the Line Weaver article. Mm. So, uh, you know, one of the kind of basic takeaways from that article is that human-like intelligence, the way that we understand, um, which we barely understand, but human intelligence is not necessarily an evolutionary evolutionary teleological outcome it doesn't evolution doesn't necessarily guide us uh towards this point okay now when we consider the idea of post-humanism it's often framed in these kind of evolutionary or technological evolutionary and teleological terms and the question is is this idea of the post-human this kind of anterograde intelligence niche that we've kind of uh, forecasted for ourselves and procured for ourselves to inherit. So the question is, if human intelligence is just kind of an anomalous product that's not necessarily teleological, what kind of a position are we in to presume that we can achieve these kind of post-human fantasies that we create for ourselves? Especially if we consider um, Ernst Mayer's um, proposition that intelligence is in fact a lethal mutation yeah yeah so um yeah again like a perfect kind of way of like getting to a really important point here um <clears throat> so yeah with the whole uh i mean another another <laughs> i mean it's very easy for like it to just become a compendium of fermi explanations but um another really interesting fermi explanation is that you know Intelligence, and I'm kind of defining it here, although uh, this necessarily is not the only only definition, but intelligence of our type, so human-like intelligence, as Line Weaver calls it, uh, so value-mongering intelligence, um, might not actually, you know, have any kind of, uh, you know, selective traction. So, you know, it might appear here and there, and then just kind of disappear uh, <clears throat> over, uh, you know, evolutionary time frames because there, you know it might not actually just be something that's that important um so i think that connects to what you're saying with um you know is it inevitable that there are these post-human kind of uh 
uh, it's, it's a, a telloy that, you know, and in, once, a, once an animal, you know, debuts intelligence, it's just drawn into this point. Um, so yeah, like Sirkovic talks about these points as like attractors in the space of possible civilizations. But yeah, if it's, you know, I mean, again, again it, you know, it kind of, it kind of then turns into questions of like, you know, once we've debuted that form of intelligence, does, does a different form of selection uh, kick in? Uh, so, you know, that might mean that, yes, then we have, uh, you know, it's no longer natural selection. It's, um, you know, this kind of technological selection uh, that will draw us further out. But at the same time, yes, of course, there are still, you know, always going to be some form of uh, ambient background natural selection. And yeah, maybe intelligence just doesn't mean that much. So, you know, over the billions of years, like, you know, intelligent life emerges and then just kind of, you know, atrophies. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting explanation to it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you have any, yeah, if you have any kind of response to that. Not immediately, but I'll I'll think it over. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, yeah, this is really. Uh, I mean, this is why. Like, it's. Um, I have a comment on that. To yeah, follow up on that, um, what do you think? Say, like how Bataille talks about the foundation of like civilization as like a harnessing of excess and surplus. Hmm. Um, as far as I know, we're one of the only, if not the only, species on the planet that um, can produce enough of a surplus to give us space and time and energy to like do intellectual activities just for fun. Cause like in the end, that's kind of like why most of us do it, I think, because it's enjoyable to an extent. Um, and so I think perhaps um, the harnessing of and manufacturing of an excess of resources um, could be um, a fundamental uh, what do you call it? I guess um, base piece of the um, of what would allow or what would produce the conditions for what we call intelligence to arise in the way that we know it as human civilization. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so there's like material conditions. Yeah, yeah. Oh, go on. No, no, go on, go on. Well, yeah, it's funny. You know, the pie is somewhat kind of Boltzmannian in his argument here. You know, there's this good essay, I'm sure we all know, by Schrodinger called What is, what is Life? And in Schrodinger's article, this notion of uh, negentropy is first introduced. So he defines life as, he quote unquote, it sucks entropy out of its environs in order to create a kind of homeostatic um, kind of pocket where energy is converted and used uh, and so life itself is this kind of negentropic force. Now Bataille, I think, reminds us that this is metastable and that kind of thermodynamic uh, entropy would kind of take the countervailing tendency and dissipate and re-undergo entropy again. So all this kind of talk in Bataille of excess and dissipation um, and annihilation, I think that Bataille is kind of pointing to the fact that life itself in the kind of Schrodingering, uh, Schrodinger, in Schrodinger's sense, is uh, negentropic and kind of implicitly metastable. Yeah, to maintain a stable closed energy system, it takes extra energy from external from of the system, right? So that's what we're doing, right? Is that what negentropic means? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, uh, Negentropic, like I, again, you know, someone, someone else here probably have a far better definition than I do, but um, you know, it's the idea of uh, dissipating, dissipating more energy, like globally, uh, to retain some sense of order locally. Uh, so, given that, uh, given that premise, um, that there is this kind of idea that I've noticed in a bunch of places in papers on these topics, that you know. It takes a thermodynamic um, view of intelligence and intelligenesis uh, and kind of says that it's this inevitable point. It's this kind of inevitable thing that will happen given thermodynamics because, you know, uh, given the sense that, you know, uh, you know, these kind of systems tend towards, dis dissipative systems tend towards like dissipating more and more. Uh, 
and intelligence is, as far as we know, uh, terrestrially the most dissipative system, uh, really energy intensive. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, I think it's in a paper by Lawrence Krauss. There's like an implication that, uh, you know, therefore civilizations, intelligent civilizations are kind of this way of <laughs> the universe to commit suicide, um, which is, you know, kind of a, a cool idea. Um, <clears throat> but like, uh, and it's actually something that we're going to come back to later on. So I mentioned that we're going to um, look at this genealogy of um, uh, ideas of like, uh, you know, how human extinction is kind of this endpoint of world history. Um, and obviously you get you, these ideas are popular now with like land and stuff like that. But they go back, as I said, they go back to the mid 19th century. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so yeah, we'll explore that later on. But yeah, these, I mean, these are, yeah, again, they're all uh, like super, super interesting things. But yeah, the idea that the universe is somehow killing itself uh, or we are, we are just the universe killing itself. I mean, uh, what's his name? Zapf. Um, and a uh, German uh, philosopher called Mainlander had similar kind of ideas, like a, 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 a you know, a lo like a quite a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> so yeah. Anyway, I mean, does anyone have any more kind of uh, you know questions questions on this? I guess uh, one thing that I wanted to point out, which has been brought up, but that I think is relevant from the Lineweaver paper, is he talks a lot about how um, our definition of what intelligence is kind of has to be operational and defined on analogy to us. And so he's saying, well, it's, it's kind of, it doesn't make a lot of sense to define a kind wherein there is only one species that has human-like intelligence and it's us. Then we go looking for human-like intelligence and we're not going to find something else like us because there's all of these specific preconditions that led to us. So the our capacity to define what intelligence is by virtue of the fact that it's by reference to a specific instantiation of it, um, forbids us from recognizing what other forms of intelligence could possibly exist. And I think, you know, then you go to something like encephalization quotient, which is allows you to have an operational definition or the ability to uh, create radio telescopes or something like that. But none of these things are probably going to be characteristic of, you know, if there is such a thing as intelligence that exists across species that could be uh, recognizable. It's um, I don't think we're going to get it from any of those sorts of operational definitions, but we're also not going to get it from defining intelligence by virtue of its of its humanness. Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, that was yeah, like uh, I mean, yeah, line mover. The, the, the human-like intelligence seems to be what the, what its name implies, species-specific. Uh, that's his, you know, th that's one of the things that he kind of concludes. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's why I brought this up because it's, you know, I think that this gives us reason enough to care, um, and, you know, not rest upon our Copernican laurels, um, because, you know, intelligence might, in, again, in some, you know, ec ecumenical definition, be some background activity, but of the sort that we're, we have is, you know, possibly cosmologically, uh, singular. So, you know, yeah, again, um, like I said originally, these questions are all uh, hotly debated, and I'm absolutely no authority on them. But it's, you know, I think it's to come at it, to come at, uh, yeah, yeah, to come at it from that kind of, you know, philosophical kind of outlook. It's, you know, these are the question, these are the kind of facts that, you know, interact with what the stakes are, uh, and that's what I'm interested in: is what are the stakes, you know? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I was. Uh, I was going to go on and talk about um, some of the kind of empirical scientific discoveries uh, that were key to making us care about extinction in 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 the Enlightenment. Um, so we can we can do that, or if if you guys want to go just to pure discussion now, um, it's, it's up to you guys. So if anyone's strong, I, I have a I have a further question. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm. You talked about axiological severity, the axiological severity of a, of a scenario of existential risk. It seems to me that, okay, the argument hangs in, in a form of value, in a form of value that is, you know, in, embodied by, you know, humans as sapient beings, right? So how, if, if the value is a, value is a function of a rarity 
in a cosmological scale, how would you, for instance, answer to the question, should we terraform Mars? Because there are, there are arguments regarding, you know, the specificity of you know, Martian landscape. And it, it is also an argument from value taken as, you know, uh, a result of its rarity or its specificity or its singularity in a cosmological scale. So the, the thing is, uh, and, and further, further than that, the Line Weaver uh, article leaves open a question of, you know, an intelligence completely unconnected to our own. So, I mean, this reminds me of David Roden's disconnection thesis in post-human life. So this, this begs the question, why, what, uh, why should we, why should we value human-like intelligence first and foremost in, I mean, in purely rational terms, not in our effective emotional attachments to it, but in purely rational terms, why should we value human-like intelligence first and foremost? Uh, and uh, this would yield a, 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 an answer, a specific answer to the question, should you terraform Mars, which is yes, if we uh, sustain human exceptionalism in a sense. And then a third, a third question that is that is kind of uh, entwined with that: What do you think of antinatalism? Because antinatalism is a form of philosophy that has also this base is based on value as uh, on value. It's it's an axiological argument wherein you know the inexistence of life or the inexistence is is of humans. Not antinatalism. There's the the human extinction movement, which is something something else but it's kind of related there is this, this is uh, the, the the inexistence of the human species is a is a is a value uh, is is of more value to the other parts of you know this this cosmological whole you know so it all in a sense hangs for me in a form of human exceptionalism or in a value placed higher on a human form of intelligence than any other potential forms of intelligence. So this is my question. My my questions in this. So yeah, I, incredibly rich questions. I, I I'll try and uh, respond to uh, all all uh, three of them uh, uh, in a way that does justice. Um, so yeah, I would say it's not so much human exceptionalism as like value exceptionalism. Um, for a start, so um, you know, <clears throat> this, I mean, this is the, this is again a thing that I'm going to be arguing throughout, um, and it will be really interesting to kind of get an ongoing dialogue on on these questions. Is that I'm arguing that value isn't at, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with what actually happens, you know, which might sound weird, um, but it's basically. I mean, again, it's this Kantian idea that, you know, kind of to have any kind of objective world in view, you presuppose this kind of framework of adjudication and appraisal of objective uh, claims. And, you know, and that basically requires like rule following in a sense. And the, the content of rules is basically uh, kind of, you know, topic neutral, uh, which basically means that, you know, I mean, Brandon calls this subjunctive robustness. All it means is that that there's a sense in which, uh, and again, it's what I was saying earlier about how the contentfulness of ideals or goals uh, has nothing to do with the maximality or minimality of their actualization and instantiation. It's to do with their internal coherence, um, which again is a, a matter for, of uh, debate. Uh, it's not like a given. Um, and, you know, it, it's it, it, it's yeah this this idea that um you know it's because we can think about like it's because we can think about like possibilities that we can be actually correct um is what i'm arguing but yeah i mean it's that they're different they're just different registers uh value and fact and this is kind of what i'm like pointing towards or trying to put into focus with this uh, line weaver stuff is that um you know and it's it's yeah again this kind of like Salazian idea that uh, you know to talk about uh, 
facts and put, pick out descriptions of, of things is, is just a different grammatical mode to talking about what should be or what ought to be the case. So these things are, you know, it's to put, it's to, it's to, to I mean, it comes down to the naturalistic fallacy, like, you know, we're talking yeah, about- Yeah, there ought to be rules of criticism and there ought to, ought to do rules of, of rule following. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, questions of ought and questions of is are just different things. And I mean, that's what I'm trying, you know, I'm, again, like, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, I haven't reached any kind of secure conclusions on this, but what, this is what I'm kind of trying to put into this, uh, into this uh, astrobiological context is, you know, like, we have value here. It's, it's been produced by facts here once, but like, can we presume that it's always going to be, you know, created? I think that there's like these two different registers that are kind of colliding here. Um, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, I don't know, does that answer any of your questions? Not really, but I, 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 I was, I was uh, waiting that these would, would be questions to be answered during the seminar as a whole. I know, mm. I, I know they are far reaching I mean, in a sense, because it, 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 it's, it pertains to the basis of what you are arguing, which is from value and maybe I'm, I'm not sure what your whole argument is but rarity has something to do with it it seems to me or specificity or singularity is it has something to do with it so once you, what you, you you mentioned now that maybe facts produce value once so what is the value that facts are producing it it, it is the fact that we have we are as a species are able to adjudicate to you know to produce judgments so then value is something that inextricably uh, linked to, to our own unfolding as a species. Then, then this is correct. But nevertheless, uh, aren't the, there is a the concurrent, uh, there is a concurrent uh, conclusion that is perhaps uh, from our point of view of adjudicators and, and, and a, a species that can uh, uh, can uh, um, I'm really tired today? Sorry, uh, I have a hangover. But uh, as a species, we can we can you know value things. So value is a is a species dependent. Uh, uh, if value is a species dependent, uh, you know entity or whatever, um, uh, aren't we? Are, are, isn't reason autonomous enough to adjudicate for our our own extinction? What do, you, what do you mean by that? I mean that once we have the up and going, you know, states of reasons, mm. and they are, and they have been, you know, naturalistic. This space of reason is naturalistic, dependent in the in the order of causes mm. uh, to the species, mm. to our species. But then, this space, if if we are valuing our our species as something that produces value itself, then it seems to me that there is, there is a point wherein value can be adjudicated, even if this space was produced, you know, naturalistically uh, understood, produced uh, as, a, as dependent, as species dependent, it has some autonomy. I mean, once this space, the, this, this grammar is produced, isn't reason in this sense of being this grammar that can adjudicate value isn't 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 reason maybe autonomous enough to adjudicate our own extinction right yeah yeah so getting back to the antinatalism thing yeah yeah right so like <laughs> could it yeah could it i mean like you said antinatalism is a is a is a value uh based argument you know there's there's suffering suffering is bad get rid of the suffering yeah. um i mean i think that conflates value with uh like no susception like feeling of pain um that i think i know and and to get back to the rarity thing i'm not making i don't i don't think i'm making the argument that intelligence is valuable because it's rare uh i'm saying i'm basically Although, I mean, although, you know, that definitely is part of it. I'm just saying that, you know, talking about what is, is just different from talking about what ought to be. So these two registers are just divergent. 
So, um, and obviously there is an interesting point where they connect and that's the job of, you know, cognitive psychologists and, and you know, other adjacent fields. But, you know, it's not rarity that makes it valuable, it's just the value itself. So, you know, obviously I'm making some kind of like deontological thing, uh, you know, deontological argument here. Um, I'm, you know, I'm basically saying it's like part of the structure of, you know, con like self-conscious agency means that it cannot but be uh, interested in these kind of values. So not just values of suffering or uh, hedonism, uh, values of like, you know, we cannot but be interested in answering these kind of summons. So these kind of summons are what, what I said by topic neutral. Um, they're not based on what actually happens. They're not based on, you know, the frequency of their instantiation within time, uh, whether we classify that as, you know, the amount of times that beings like us successfully obey them or the amount of times that these kind of values appear uh, in the factual order, order or the order of causes. Um, no, it's that, you know, they, they, they have this kind of, um, their content comes from entirely beyond that. Um, and, you know, that might sound uh, kind of like, um, you know, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps uh, or like, you know, trying to get something for free. But yeah, I would just retort with like the idea that, you know, these kind of values are just presupposed by self-conscious agency, uh, you know, and self-conscious agency is something that evidently uh, we have and we engage in. So, uh, you know, that's a kind of transcendental argument, I guess. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I leave it here, so we'll we'll, we'll catch up later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, I mean, these are these are yeah. Like I said, like I'm thinking through these things, and it's yeah. yeah I mean, should we colonize Mars? <laughs> I don't know. Probably. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, uh, does it, yeah? Does anyone else have any uh, comments or questions or anything? Uh, just quickly regarding the axiological question, I wanted to push back quickly against um, your characterization of fact and value, at least as it's presented in Kant, uh, because I think there's this sort of like enlightenment misconstrual of what the pre-enlightenment characterization of these problems was. And, you know, on behalf of my Aristotelian Thomas friends, uh, I wanted to point out that for, um, for an Aristotelian, there isn't such a thing as the good. There are good X's, right? There's um, one of the characterizations that you get in um, uh, somebody like um, Geech, who's um, a modern uh, to uh, Thomas Aristotelian, is uh, he talks about um, X is a big flea. He says, okay, well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean X is a flea and also X is big. Um, it means the, uh, because then you would get uh, from that that, well, um, if X is a big flea, that means that X is a big animal, which of course that can't make sense. So it's it's big insofar as it's a flea. Um, so he talks about this as um, an attributive property and not a predicative property. And um, I think that's sort of like crucial to apprehending what's going on in the um, in the pre-modern um, and particularly Aristotelian conception of how value works, because it's not the the sort of idea that well the universe is is laden with value and there's all of these uh, all of these values that we just need to um, uh, unravel and and account for it's like well no there's things have um, a particular set of characteristics and there's a particular way in which they can fulfill those characteristics and insofar as we take things in the world and apprehend them uh, we have to encounter them through a value laden framework uh, which cannot um, abstract to like a general picture of the good. So, I mean, I'm not personally particularly defending that account, but I think we need to be clear about what we're objecting to and not take sort of uh, Kant's um, uh, rhetoric about being like this Copernican overturning at, at its word. I think there's there's uh, like a much deeper framework um, in the, in the pre-modern, pre-enlightenment conception. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um... I think you're correct. I mean, this is one of the things of, uh, I mean, Brandon says this in the heroism and magnanimity is that, you know, um, all kind of acts of retrospection or recollection 
history, whatever you want to call it, are in some way a making. Uh, and then he says that, you know, they, they're made into a finding. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like, this is a kind of methodological thing is that, you know, when you're telling a story about the contours of the development of an idea, um, you know, you, there are exceptions, of course. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm no, you know, kind of Thomas Aristotelian expert, but I mean, I think that in general, it's safe to say that, that the, the peripatetic and scholastic and Aristotelian worldview is basically does conflate norm and nature a lot of the time. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, would you, do you think that that's false? Um, I think it's false in that the conception of norm is not um, a continuous with the contemporary conception of norm. Um, yeah, in, in that um, the way in which, like a lot of it, I think there's a, been a revival of some of these Thomas ideas as in the philosophy of science, we see things like um, the theory ladenness of data and, um, and then going from theory ladenness to value ladenness in the way that we, um, we apprehend the world. I think this has returned a lot of people to thinking about things within those sorts of Aristotelian terms. But one thing that I think that we could take uh, that's, that's interesting about the, the Kantian uh, problematic where we have these things that are universals about rational agents, I mean, this may be uh, just taking the particular uh, telos of, um, of something like a human as though it were a universal. You know, there's, it, it could be uh, still consistent with something like um, an Aristotelian value framework, uh, wherein we're just um, taking the characteristics that are that are a characteristic of like human flourishing and look, um, considering that as though it were universal, rather than like the local property of some particular kind of agent. And so, like I mean, I think it's that's worth considering when we're talking about something like you know what is an intelligent agent? What would be an intelligent agent on a planet other than Earth? How could they develop? Well, um, what what would be characteristic of them? Um, may not be characteristic of the, you know, uh, of anything other than the sort of agents that we are. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think that, I mean, that, yeah, you're right to say that the, you know, the, the norm as we understand it now is just like not a thing in that tradition. Um, I mean, and again, this is like, uh, it's, again, it's a question of um, uh, how you couch these things. So, it's right, yeah. It's part of part of part of my argument, you know, is that on one level you say, yeah, I say, you know, uh, the reason why people didn't think or care about extinction in the ancient world was because of this mingling of norm and nature, you know, and that's quite a high level, as in like abstract, low resolution uh, way of saying it. Um, yeah, it's not so much that you're right. Yeah, it's not like just that. Oh, they lived in a you know this kind of yeah triumphalist Kantian idea that they lived in this universe that was just like you know uh, made out of values. It's it's more there's more like fineness to it. So like I mean it's more the sense in which uh, I think that there is a mingling of like propositional content and existence itself. So it's not necessarily value in this kind of axiological or uh, judicial sense. It's more the sense in which um, that, you know, there's the, so, I mean, one, one of the things is, I mean, just, just to get into it, uh, you know, we're going to talk about this more next week, but um, is this, this modal thing, the principle of plenitude, uh, you know, the idea that all possibilities are uh, eventually realized. It's a presupposition that you get, uh, I mean, Aristotle is actually the first person to, uh, put it into logical form. Um, and all it argues, uh, yeah, is the, you know, there is no such thing as an unrealized uh, and legitimate possibility. Um, and basically what that means is that, uh, what it means in the Aristotelian context, so, you know, there's, um, it's used in all these myriad different ways throughout the history of philosophy. But in the particularly Aristotelian sense, it's basically means that the only things that uh, never happen are impossible for logical reasons or reasons, you know, apodictic reasons, um, which I think lends itself precisely into the facts of the, like the, you know, that Aristotelian science is like demonstra demonstrative uh, to the very extent that it is. Like there's, it basically presumes that nature itself is just 
interminably compliant with syllogistic analysis and these kind of propositional structures. Um, so, so yeah, it's more fine structured than the sense in which, yeah, all the, all the ancients were silly and thought that, um, you know, this, the world had this axiological uh, and basically theistic framework. Um, you know, it, it, there are epistemic um, uh, permutations of this idea. So, you know, they're not unrelated. So you can, you can, you know, have this more fine, more sophisticated sense of values, 100% for sure. Uh, but I do think that, you know, throughout, throughout the pre-modern world, like there was this basic um, presumption that, you know, it was just an unexpected, uninspected um, idea that, you know, the universe itself had some kind of propositional structure, uh, you know, and, and, and then if, uh, if, uh, you know, if, 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 if the universe itself has this rational structure, then reason itself cannot cease to be. Um, so <clears throat> I don't know, I don't know if you have any kind of response to that. Sorry, I, I didn't catch the last thing that you said there. Um, so yeah, the basic idea being that, um, you know, uh, values aside, uh, if you presume that the universe itself has some kind of inherently rational structure, um, and it doesn't have to be couched in moral terms, it can be couched in epistemic terms. Uh, yeah, if you presume the universe to have this kind of rational structure, then reason itself cannot cease to be. That, I mean, that's the basic idea, yeah. That's the idea behind the sort of like Kantian account? Is, is no, that what you're posing? I mean, that's just, what, that's just why I'm arguing as a causal account of uh, why, um, you know, extinction and the severity of it was not actually um, cognizable within, uh, you know, pre-modern framework. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I don't think we have to couch everything in terms of, like, of reason. Like, telos does not imply reason, right? So I think that... Um, the thing is that we we wouldn't take um, reason as being the characteristic feature of what is value worthy in a in a pre modern conception. Rather than like for for Kant, there's a sort of like um, taking of a particular set of characteristics as being these are these are the things that are worthy of value that are worthy of spreading, and that's where you can get within like people like. Bostrom and so on, this sort of endorsement of, well, everything will be good if we just spread intelligence as widely as possible. Um, but that doesn't require a conception of the universe as, as inherently like rational or prone to reason, I don't think. I think it just requires an account in, in which um, the, the things have to be encountered in, um, in, their in their instantiation, essentially, and that such and such an instantiation has such and such capacities, and the ful fulfillment of those capacities is what's characteristic, not the taking of any particular capacity as the one which ought to be, uh, like, that will be desirable for the most of matter to be uh, the instantiation of, like, saying that, well, we ought to have, uh, it would be an ideal situation in which most of the world became, most of the universe became intelligent just because we were reconfiguring planets so that they would be able to think and so on. Like, um, that's sort of like um, unintelligible from that, that prior perspective, but it's, it's not really, um, I don't think it, uh, that presumes like an inherent rationality just presumes like an axiology, which is, which is foreign to, to us at this point. And you know, we've been discussing this from the, with the heuristic of rationality and I suppose epistemology. But there's something else, especially when it comes to um, anthropogenetic or anthropogenic risks. And it's something we haven't talked about yet. And that's the notion of power, power itself. And this is where I think that uh, Nietzsche becomes especially relevant in that we're considering ever more risk um, due to the fact that human organized technological power has grown to the point that it is rational to fear um, the destructive capacity of human actors equally so to that of uh, the non-human environment or even greater so than the non-human environment. But then concomitant with power is also 
rationality. So that's, you know, for those who uh, still find a richness in the Enlightenment, they'll say, okay, because there was this um, kind of impetus to make strong commitments to the enterprise of rationality. But then those who critique it will also say that concomitant with Renaissance rationality was this arrogation of power that was used for colonialism, imperialism, and so on. Uh, and so I think that when we consider this kind of, uh, these matters of eschatology, apocalypse, or extinction, um, and macro strategy, this is where the notion of responsibility and how we're going to assume responsibility with respect to rationality and power come in. If we're going to be eschatological, then we are not going to assume as much responsibility and we're going to impute the destructive capabilities to something outside of human power. And if we're going to assume more responsibility, then we will interrogate the relationship between rationality and human power. So I just wanted to throw in Nietzsche because he hadn't gotten a reference yet. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, um, Nietzsche will <clears throat> come into play uh, a lot later on, I think. Um, but yeah, no, uh, 100%. I mean, I think that connects with what you said um, when, you, uh, when we were doing the introductions. Um, there's kind of, there's a, uh, there's like a, and this is something you don't get in the in triumphalist uh, voice of the enlighteners themselves, is the awareness of the endogeneity of uh, risk and um, prediction. So or risk and like r response, basically. Uh, there's this feedback between the two. Um, <clears throat> and we realize it all too, all too well. Well, well, do we? I don't know. Uh, but you know, it's become more visible uh, now. So a really good example of this is um, Fichte. And uh, again, so I mentioned earlier, you know, the vocation of man is one of his books. Um, <clears throat> and it's this, again, this kind of triumphalist narrative of like humanity, um, you know, d undertaking this project. And it's a really good example of all of the places in which the enlighteners weren't enlightened enough or were uncharacteristically uncritical. Because it's, you know, this narrative of like us, you know, undertaking this massive task, uh, but it's filled with all these kind of chauvinist, um, you know, kind of uh, undertones. So, you know, part of us undertaking this task for Fichte is erasing the entirety of nature. So all of planetary nature gets kind of, uh, you know, reformatted into uh, human pleasure gardens and cities and stuff. Uh, and again, this is, you know, this is a, a vision that you see all across the, the, the Enlightenment at the time. They thought that the end point would be us basically just removing everything that wasn't, you know, uh, <clears throat> wasn't like human uh, or like artificial. Um, and he talks actually about mitigation. And he says, um, he says, you know, that we're kind of, the globe will eventually have more perfect means of communication with itself uh, to the point where we can predict precisely what's going to happen. And then he says that um, there'll be a point in time when hurricanes, volcanoes and earthquakes will all be eliminated, um, which is, you know, kind of kind of cute. Um, but uh, so, you know, he thinks that this this kind of undertaking of uh, this, you know, dynamic that I identified earlier of undertaking responsibility is the same as having your um, your purview, you know, pulled forward into the future because, you know, responsibility entails guardianship. Um, you know, Fichte had this naive view of it that, you know, eventually reason would just uh, eliminate risk um, and there would be this kind of, you know, uh, perfect world without volcanoes or, you know, anything that Fichte doesn't, doesn't like or anything that's like rebarbative. Um, but yeah, what he didn't realize is exactly what you pointed out is that there's this, you know, uh, endogeneity of risk and response. So like the whole, this whole planetary apparatus of forecast, um, you know, creates in, in, in trying to predict, it creates more contingencies to predict. So there's this thickening of kind of infrastructure, uh, and it creates new exotic forms of risk. So the kind of virulent idea of every technology creates its own disaster. 
Um, and, you know, like, I mean, Bratton has a really good example of this is uh, he talks about, um, you know, if we had a uh, model um, of global climate that was like sufficiently and high resolution enough to predict what was going on everywhere meteorologically, this computation would itself become, uh, because of all the energy that would be required, would itself become one of the massive climate events to be modeled. So yeah, there's this, there's like, there's no sense in which, um, you know, risk is ineliminable to the project of reason. It's like, you know, endogenous. And the, the more, the further we get, uh, I think the more risks we create. And, you know, um, computers, perfect example. I mean, you know, computers were invented, uh, you know, they were developed, uh, you know, post World War II as this kind of, you know, great prediction uh, thing. You know, they emerge from, uh, operations research and cybernetics, which we, you know, kind of had this anticipatory uh, background. And, you know, look at all of the risks that computers have created since, you know? Um, so, yeah, um, I think, yeah, that endogeneity point is a really, really um, important one to make here. And I think, yeah, it kind of uh, tampers uh, the triumphalism of the Enlightenment. But again, I don't think it, like, destroys or eliminates the legitimacy of that kind of idea of a project of responsibility. It just is us becoming even more responsible by realizing that, you know, yeah, we create more risks by by trying to stop, uh, you know, these kind of um, calamities. But yeah. Right. But you know, there's an even more kind of perilous question about the ambiguity between rationality and power. So the question is, can rationality continue to preserve itself solely through the faculties of rationality or does it have to resort to the kind of expediency of using power this is kind of a question that comes up when we consider the renaissance so does european arrogation of its current status was that solely because it was able to use its rationality in order to kind of improve what's now a global society or did it kind of cheat and expediently just eliminate those that had a different kind of epistemological system and so on and that's the question that is so kind of boggling to me in terms of prediction and risk management and so on are we actually using rationality as a kind of like you know rationality a vector is that vector really just kind of bulldozing through these kind of challenges to rationality or are we failing to really undergo the Hegelian kind of synthetic challenge to ourselves and really um, seeking to transform and interrogate and challenge ourselves in a way that has many more kind of vicissitudes and is not really dodging challenges to our rationality, but the dangers in our own kind of arrogance and our own kind of stasis. So that to me is the real kind of question when it comes to like risk. Is the risk endogenous or is it exogenous, et cetera? Yeah. There's a really cool example about how um, preparing for risk can end up bringing about the very event which you were trying to um, avoid in finance through, um, what are they called? Uh, reinsurance companies. So like these are companies that insure insurance companies so that they can make sure they can pay out all their claims when some kind of catastrophe happens so what they end up what the reinsurance companies end up doing though when they um what would you call it when they hedge their portfolios to account for um any potential risks or disasters that might occur in the future at least in financial markets what they end up doing in virtue uh, or by doing these activities that prepare them and hedge their portfolios to be able to make these payments and by the way they still make profits on all of these even when the catastrophes happen and they make the payments um which is crazy um, but what they do is they end up scaring everyone into thinking that the event is actually already ha going to happen so that like it ends up producing the market crisis it was trying to avoid or prepare for by preparing for it because they it, it it sends signals to everyone in the market that oh clearly this thing is happening and or it's going to happen and you don't want to be left without a chair when the music stops
yeah, I mean, uh, there. Are, I mean, again, like, uh, yeah, uh, I'm sure all of you are at least somewhat familiar with Nick Land, and he's very good at like pointing out these places where you know, kind of, uh, capitalism creates its own calamities. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, to get back to the, uh, um, that's a really interesting example of that actually that I wasn't familiar with. Um, Just to be clear though, I wasn't positing that as like an example of why we shouldn't prepare for risks. I was just, it was just an example of like some really weird performative aspect of some types of risk preparation. Yeah, 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 no, um, <clears throat> for sure, yeah. And um, yeah, to get back to the question of, uh, um, I mean, it's a really good example of like this kind of uh, inverted form of like um, Hegel's ruse of reason. You know, is that it's it's not the word like it's not the you know the force of the bare reason is kind of uh, creating this upswell through the like you know rough and tumble and chaos of history towards something. You know, even in spite of irrational actors, is making us more rational. Uh, the kind of example that you just pull, you just propose is. Uh, um, the opposite of that is this kind of, you know, um, uh, there's this, you know, ruse of unreason. But yeah, um, and as, yeah, similar point is, uh, you know, the um, what James, what you were saying uh, is, yeah, like, um, I mean, I think the, the, the kind of rationalist answer would be like, yeah, we're ne of course, we're never good enough, uh, you know, um, we're, we're, in that sense of we're never truly o ever going to overcome you know, those kind of arrogations. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, if any of you enjoyed the um, the random um, reading, uh, I'm sure I'm sure a lot of you have already read it, but there's an essay by him called, um, uh, was it Genealogy and the Hermeneutics of uh, uh, Magnanimity? Um, are any of you familiar with that one? Okay, yeah, I, I mean, oh, no, sorry, go on. Yeah, I'm familiar. Yeah. So, uh, well, go on, just uh, just because you you ask. So yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you, I, I mean, so, uh, if you, yeah, I mean, if you wanted to, just kind of, if you were, were you going to say anything about how it connects with this, or is it? No, no. Actually, actually, I'm I'm also re reading the sidebar here, and um, I'm thinking out loud because you know, uh, modernity can be can be understood also as the uh, as the advent of you know uh, a picture of the world that dispenses with final causes in the sense of Aristotelianism, and I was asking myself if you know uh, uh, does that does the does lack of a final cause is what uh, recouched you know a, a picture of a cosmos without propositional form this propositional form has something to do with the presence of final causes in nature and the, is is the presence of final causes the responsible of what you're, you were calling a norm value conflation in aristotelianism or something like that you know because you know final a final cause kind of presupposes a, a in the pre-modern picture, a kind of uh, harmony towards what the cosmos is, and part of you know the scientific method is not to presuppose such a thing and to explain things in terms of efficient causes. And uh, uh, I don't remember now how this was connected to the Brandon stuff. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I just uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Uh, let me try and think how that might connect with the Brandon. Um, but I mean, the essays. I mean, it's a really, really clear, well-written essay, um, and it's more consumable than the um, heroism and magnanimity one. So I probably should have set that one instead. Um, but he defines the project of genealogy um, from so yeah to raise Nietzsche. Uh, from Nietzsche to the, you know, what he calls the grand unmaskers of uh, the 20th century. So, you know, Freud, um, 
<clears throat> and 19th century Marx. Um, sorry, yeah, 20th century, um, 19th century, both. Um, so yeah, um, it, it, Marx and Freud, this like project of uh, unveiling is that you basically uh, discover, yeah, arrogations in uh, our kind of discursive framework. So um, what you do is you'd say, you know, that a certain belief that we have is counterfactually dependent on, upon a cause. So the ultimate example uh, in Marx is, um, you know, say, if I wasn't brought up in, you know, this petty bourgeois background, I wouldn't hold this certain economic belief. Um, in Freud, you know, if I, uh, <clears throat> you know, hadn't had such and such primal, primal scene, I wouldn't hold this, you know, particular uh, erotic desire. You know, these, or, you know, psychological, anything in psychology, basically. Um, you know, it's to show that this, the, the idea of genealogy is to show that instead of having beliefs in the sense of rationally justified, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, commitments that are responsive to norm norms, uh, they're actually just causes. So it unveils the structure of, you know, uh, ration rationality as basically just being this kind of parade of natural causes. Um, and so, yeah, Brandon, you know, it's a really great definition of um, genealogy in that sense. Uh, and, you know, actually, he, yeah, he says that, uh, you know, in, in Kant's um, dis distinction between uh, reason and cause, uh, you find, you know, the seed of genealogy as the revenge of that distinction upon itself. Um, so, you know, what that means is, you know, Kant was like, you know, Locke was wrong to say that, you know, we we have these beliefs because of this kind of, uh, you know, uh, pipeline of causes. Uh, and, you know, Kant said that, you know, it produces a mere physiology of the understanding. Uh, Kant was like, no, there are also questions of justification. These are, uh, you know, criteria of appraisal that are required. So, you know, we need to keep the reason and the cause distinct in our, um, in our kind of, you know, epistemic uh, framework. Uh, but then you can you can actually take revenge. You know that distinction can have its own revenge on itself and be like, okay, yeah. So reasons and causes are mutually exclusive. Everything's just causes. Um, so you know, yeah. This is you know this is important because it is basically the idea that history is just you know has has no kind of uh, there is no there is no reason in history. There's just it's just causes all the way down. Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> which uh, isn't the idea of there being a reason to history like the exact same idea that the line weaver piece is trying to criticize? That like if you just pick out one any particular extreme and trace back its development, it obviously looks like everything was leading up to that. So, so then wouldn't line weaver be criticizing teleological conceptions of history without maybe knowing it yeah yeah i so i i that's actually this is really in, this really interesting so yeah like i mean brandon has this idea of recollective rationality which is that you know we basically do the nasalization quotient but for some norm that we hold dear um so basically all that, what i mean by that is you know you create this you retrospectively and reconstruct this kind of uh, genesis of a norm or, you know, coming into explicitness of a norm throughout our kind of discursive practices. Um, and yeah, you're, you're right to notice that there's a parallel there between, uh, you know, what line weaver's discussing and uh, that, but line weaver's talking about evolutionary history. So it's, you know, there's a, there's a distinction between, I think there's a distinction to be made between natural history and, uh, history construed as like a progression of human ideas. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, and again, this is good, good, good. this keys into what we were talking about earlier in terms of you know, uh, the, the, in defense, and it's not something that I I would you know it's not a hill I would die on, but in defense of the transhumanist presumption of them there being this grand telos, uh, you know, of posthuman development, uh, you would you could say that yes, there are different uh, there are different criteria and different mechanisms that kick in as soon as you get that kind of. Uh, intelligence human construed uh the project of that off the ground there's these different these different uh, mechanisms uh can kick in um 
so yeah, I mean, just to try and again to try and kind of bring together some very diverse, different, um, you know, uh, conversations there. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a, <laughs> that's an interesting thing to notice. Yeah. So yeah, I haven't actually been paying attention to the um, group chat. Uh, is uh, is there anything here it's that? A bit I've... late now. <laughs> it's been going on for a while. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I should have been. <laughs> Maybe we should ask about who is going to be the next presenter for the next session. Who wants to present? Who wants to respond? Uh, how do how do the presentations work? Like, is it just on one of the readings? It's uh, either one of the readings or both of the readings, and you give us something like fifteen minutes of. Uh, a delineation, uh, an abstraction of, of the text. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just basically a, a presentation yeah. of, of such. Yeah, I just wasn't, because there's like something like three or four texts for, for next week, so I wasn't sure if multiple people were presenting or, or whatever. I can be I can be one of them if they're, uh, so I, I volunteer. Well, you can present one text or all four texts. I okay. think it would be good to make a digest, but that is uh, a decision that Tom finally would need to, to do. do. I, I, I personally think you get the most out of it if you make a digest and you okay. close the texts. Okay. What do you mean by a digest? A digest meaning uh, uh, you, you don't do, uh, you describe the text in a short abbreviated uh, matter. That's what I mean. You just describe one text, another text, another text, and then you try to delineate uh, and 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 find uh, crossings between the texts. I think that's all, always interesting to hear, and also good because then you really have to engage with the actual material. And who would like to respond to the text? I can. I mean, I'm off work for like next week, so I have time. I can do it. So, Pop, then I'll note you down. So, I'm I'm responding to Matthew, or responding to like Matthew's presentation, or am I responding to one of the texts or the texts, all of them? You mean uh, everybody who is in the seminar? should read all of the texts for the next session. And I think you should also make a response to all those, all, all these, all the readings. Okay. That would be best. So and if there is one comment that we want to delve upon and talk about, then it would be good to read it in front of the class. I'm just saying so that if people who are currently on the live stream on YouTube uh, can also listen to what uh, we are currently talking and thinking about. Yes, yeah, so I just give an idea of uh, what the texts are next week so you can <clears throat> um, choose in advance which ones you want to focus on uh, if you're doing the digest or presentation. Uh, so yeah, the first one is the Hintika text, uh, and that's, um, it's, uh, the history of ideas, uh, it's about the history of modality, um, and this, this idea of plenitude. Um, the second one is, uh, Gramelsberger, and it's on the, uh, the history of, uh, kind of computational prediction. It's a really good text. Um, and then the last two are, uh, one by Robert Klee and then one by Milan Serkovic again. Um, and uh, there, Serkovic's replying to Klee. Uh, so Klee comes up with this idea of human expunction, uh, which is the idea that, you know, we won't only go extinct, but there'll be a point in future time when absolutely all trace of us will be removed. Um, and Serkovic uh, doesn't like this idea and comes, retorts uh, quite, um, 
interestingly against it. So yeah, those those are the texts. Uh, so gives you some idea of what what um, <clears throat> uh, what they are. Yeah. Sounds cool. So yeah, I should. Uh, um, Patrick, how how much? Uh, when 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 are we um, wrapping up here? I've lost track of the time. Something like in twenty minutes. All right, cool. Okay, so let me just have a look through. Uh, let me have a look through the group chat, and if, if you guys have anything, um, any other comments or anything, then just uh, shoot. But I'm going to have a look through the group chat and just see, because uh, obviously I haven't had a chance yet. Yeah, regarding the, the hermeneutics of magnanimity, I just posted a Ray Berthier's talk on it. I don't know if you know about it. Sophistry, suspicion. What, what is it called? Sophistry, suspicion, oh. and theory. Uh, I think it's quite good, even though it doesn't come to any conclusion. But what I think is interesting is that Ray makes a critique of Brandon, even though he thinks that um, to think that the Brandonian account of meaning is is best among alternatives. There is the problem that uh, it is a, a forcefully imperative account of reason in the sense that. For Ray, it seems to be impossible to have, a, you know, a dissociation, a kind of gap between forms, or different forms of reason. And he's, he's talking about uh, Alain Badiou in contrast. Uh, he, he doesn't want to bite to bite into the bullet of theory and say that philosophy, you know, philosophy is always uh, this imperialistic, you know, uh, imperialistic endeavor. But I think what, what, what interests me in Ray's project, and I think it's, it's kind of uh, related to what, what we were discussing, is the fact that he has to uphold uh, an autonomy of reason, and reason in uh, mostly Celar's and Brandomian sense, uh, while at the same time reason being capable of recognizing the absence of propositional form in you know, non-linguistic reality or something like that. And I think Brandon is, is kind of uh, uh, open to this um, danger of conflating, you know, what for us and in itself, in a sense, which, which, which Ray is trying to keep apart. And it seems to me to be the problem he sees in Brandon's account, and this is why I think he thinks Sellers, Sellers is one is superior in that in that sense, uh, and this was why I, I was I was talking about final causes. What what in reality is responsible to our our understanding of it as having propositional form in a sense, in the sense of the premoderns, right? Because you know, in the doctrine of four causes in Aristotle in Aristotle. Uh, there's this final cause which had to be, you know, uh, abandoned in order to have, you know, modernity and theoretical method. So uh, it seems to me, I don't, I don't really, it has to be more fine grained. It seems to me it has to do something to do with the idea of a finalism or, 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 or of there being final causes in reality itself, this conflation that was the pre modern conflation we were talking about norms and values. And this is just another way of couching the the idea of norm in the sense of the premoderns, because they there were there weren't such a thing uh, in the same sense that there is for us. So yeah, a whole bunch of a cluster of things. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, yeah, Sellers said that you know, like, uh, there was scope for like an extensionalist, purely extensionalist account of agency. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and this is like where you know his that kind of idea of the Percy and Longview, you know, they would at some point be, uh, you know, a vocabulary which would explain everything about our, our rational agency in an extensionist vocabulary. 
Um, but he said that, yeah, like, I mean, I think uh, he said that, you know, norms are logically irreducible, but uh, causally reducible. Um, which, yeah, you know, that's the more science scientific side of Sellers. And then, yeah, Brandon, you know, doesn't like that idea. Um, and yeah, I think actually I see where you're getting at with the final cause thing, because I mean, if 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 as Brandon appears to hold that, you know, norms aren't even causally reducible, then yeah, there's like it that looks that begins to look at a certain level that begins to look a lot like the final cause. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's well, it's because of Brandon's Hegelianism. I mean, he has, he, he has uh, you know, this idea you know and it's kind of out it's out in the kind of edges of his thought and i'm not particularly uh you know too i, I don't think i fully grasped it yet yet but he does have this kind of idea that uh, conceptual realism he calls it um you know the idea that like yeah there is a sense in which uh reality is conceptually articulated um which yeah i don't know maybe that brings us back to the beginning talking about pre-moderns and stuff but yeah um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just looking up at the chat, so Alex was talking about, um, <laughs> yeah, the Martin Rees thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it probably is, I mean, 50-50 is, like, what does that mean? So, uh, I mean, Alex, if you want to, uh, talk, uh, about that, um, cause I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Cause I mean, I think, I think, yeah, being charitable to him, that's probably a provocation rather than an actual forecast. Um, but yeah, I agree with your comments. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is one of my big problems that I have with like this Taurus reading. I thought it was almost ludicrously bad. Like I, I, I couldn't, there, there's so many faulty assumptions that it's hard to even, um, get anything tractable out of it. Um, but for me, one of the core things is like this misapprehension of what, what a risk is, I think. And that's one of the core things that we're coming up against where, uh, one of the distinctions that's made is between um, uh, risk and uncertainty. And so you can say that like a risk is something that um, can be quantified by an actuary. You can make an assessment of it. Um, and uncertainty in the strong sense is something which we have no way of quantifying it. We have no way of making any sort of assessment of its likelihood. It's never happened. We And we don't even in many of these cases, know what sort of causal mechanism could give rise to it. Um, and so there's like a sort of category error where we're um, in this case, we're treating um, uncertainties, strong uncertainties as though they were risks. Um, and this is kind of borne out by some problems with, um, with the framework for probability that Taurus is bringing up, which he says early in this uh, book, he says something about, let's see, uh, there are multiple interpretations of probability, such as the propensity, frequency, and Bayesian interpretations, none of which we will here explore. But all of what he's saying here only makes sense if you are an epistemic Bayesian, a particular kind of Bayesian, having a particular kind of account of the foundations of probability. Because for uh, within a frequency account of, of probability, you can't assess probabilities of single events, and you certainly can't assess probabilities of events that have never happened. Um, because it's yeah, a probability in, within that interpretation will only apply um, as, as like the limiting frequency of a large number of events. Um, and so on the Bayesian interpretation, the sub subjective Bayesian, there's also an objective Bayesian school. But for subjective Bayesians, you say that a probability is a, a degree of belief. And so we're, you know, ass essentially assessing our, our beliefs about uh, some event occurring and trying to update them with regard to the evidence, et cetera. But, you still need some sort of model. You need some sort of causal mechanism. And what, what is not happening within this whole risk typology is any sort of provision of, of models or of causal mechanism by which existential risks could be instantiate, instantiated. And this is sort of like uh, one of the big problems when you have something like uh, Bostrom saying that uh, the, a risk equals the probability of an event multiplied by its consequences. Uh, because that means that you can take these sort of like ludicrously implausible scenarios and say, well, because it would end civilization, because it has this like dramatic uh, impact on us, we should take it seriously, even if it's something like Rocco's Basilisk, which we have no reason to suppose that such an agent could even um, be generated, that such an agent 
um, would have the sort of motivations that we might attribute it, uh, to it in that scenario. There's, so there's, there's, I, I don't think any of this talk makes any sense unless we can provide some sort of causal account of, you know, how intelligence could work, how you could have like, particularly the, su the super intelligent AI scenario I have problems with due to misconceptions about the possibility of a single intelligent agent. Nagar Astani has lots of good commentary on this, but I'll, I'll kind of leave that as, as, as the, um, where I'm going with this, but. Uh. Yeah, yeah, um, that, uh, yeah, again, um, like let's please have that as an ongoing um, discussion. because I think there's a lot to learn there. Um, <clears throat> Cause yeah, I mean, it's, so I mean, am I right in thinking, uh, if I just try and categorize what you just, uh, characterize what you just said is that, you know, you, you, you have an issue with the Bayesian approach to uh, risk or probability um, because it removes like a, the, the sense of etiology, which is something that we need for it to be uh, kind of um, uh, meaningful. Uh, is, that, is, that, is that a way, would that be a correct way of characterizing what you just said? Well, th that would be part of it, but I think that even if we are like going to be epistemic Bayesians um, in, in this manner, I still think it's unreasonable to provide these sorts of bald estimates because like what's what's going into this is just our assessment of probabilities and some sort of um, updating on the basis of uh, evidence, but we cannot have any sort of um, of tractable evidence about the likelihood of some something like an existential collapse. Um, and so I, I think that there's even from the viewpoint if 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 you are uh, assuming subjective probabilities, there's um, there's an error in in taking um, what is necessarily um, un, um, strongly uncertain as as something which we can provide some sort of like risk assessment of. So yeah, I, like there is at the level of etiology, I think that 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 is what's essential. But it's a problem regardless of what sort of interpretation of probability you have. It's just it becomes more of a problem um, if you aren't willing to accept that you know the, the the assessments of our current experts like there's a lot here in this in this Taurus paper which it it takes like the members of the future of uh what's, what's the institute called the uh, future of human life something like this um it takes their estimates as the basis for assessing like um the the prospects of humanity it's like these are people who have been selected self-selected or uh, worrying about the prospects of humanity in the long term. We can't, why would we take these people seriously? Why would we take Michael Reese or um, Martin Reese uh, seriously? Because he's um, like funding these sorts of institutes. He, like he has a, a strong investment in this sort of account. Um, and we have, we have no sort of basis for making these sorts of assessments, except for these sorts of uh, radical science fiction scenarios, which I like um, without Without, when we don't have something like even an, an account of intelligence, particularly the, the superhuman AI scenario, I think is is so so far off the mark. Like there, there's a lot of more interesting things I think with uh, like autonomous techniques gone out of control. Um, there there's scenarios in which I think dumb technologies are much more likely to have sort of catastrophic effects that are just sort of let to run themselves, and that they they can approach this sort of like. Um, uh, behavior where they, they they have no sort of discursive responsibility or um, ability to to modulate themselves based on um, any sort of assessment of of the impact of of, um, of their actions. But um, yeah, I, I'm just very very skeptical of uh, this this whole account um, of how we could make an assessment of this. Yeah, yeah, and I again, um, like I just said, uh, like <clears throat> let, like I'm excited to hear more uh, from you on that topic uh, going like yeah going forward because um, yeah I mean you know I uh, <clears throat> uh, you know I myself I'm not you know an effector altruist or any of these kind of uh, you know my, my interest is in the in the in the history thing so yeah like it's uh, and it, yeah there you know like, again without the background but like you know you notice like Bostrom saying um, I think it's Bostrom some I mean I've seen it in the literature right uh, that you know there's like a covariance between severity and uh, right, like uh, frequency. Um, it's or, or at least it seems to be there's an implicit assumption that like very severe events happen less often. Um, 
something about that seems suspicious to me. I mean, where would you stand on that? I mean, it seems like, um, like you said, I mean, and again, this is where the observation selection stuff comes in, but like, you know, obviously, I mean, how can you judge that, right? Um, <clears throat> I mean, what would you say to, yeah, that just, just that proposition that, you know, severe events uh, are, are inherently less likely? Well, so like, I mean, one of the problems that comes up in, in this paper, which is a problem for a lot of the sorts of Bayesian accounts is like the selection of what counts as an event and how you generate your um, your space of possible events where within which probabilities are assessed. Um, and so you get things like these, like multiple conditions of will it happen in this, uh, will the catastrophic event happen in the second decade of the century? Will it happen in the third decade? And then what's treated as an event um, then becomes the way of assessing the likelihood. Uh, but I, like I, a lot of this is just due to sort of like um, the the problem of, of induction writ large, essentially that that you know how can we without uh, taking into account the fact that the world is constantly changing and that the conditions are not remaining the same um, and that there's all of these variables taking place. How how can we uh, possibly presume that there will be some sort of like constant stability of, of likelihoods of uh, some particular uh, catastrophic outcome. I, like, I, I just don't think it's a, a legitimate inference. Right. And you know, this, this Torres article, which I agree, I found it kind of appalling. Not only is it Bayesian, but it's kind of, it's kind of an exercise in this weird kind of, I would say pre-modern kind of Bayesianism. So especially if you evaluate existential risks as some sort of event that's going to preempt this kind of technological civilizational fantasy that you have. So that, so you have your postmodern, or sorry, postmodern, you have your post-human uh, condition that is your ideal. So that's the given in this Bayesian uh, equation. So given this, what's the probability uh, that uh, it will be it will be preempted? And the thing is, if we go back to Brandom. It's difficult to view this kind of post-human condition as a normative status in the, in, and are thinking about it as a normative attitude in the modern sense because it's very difficult to um, critique it and apply meta concepts to it um, and interrogate it because we viewed it as this kind of fixed point along a kind of teleological trajectory um, that we're not going to reconsider because the very kind of reconsideration of it or the preemption of it happening, we're now imputing that kind of divergence from this terminal point to an actual existential risk. So it's, uh, it's weirdly pre-modern, uh, essentialist and kind of totalitarian. Like we have this, we have this view of this transhuman project towards this post-human future. And if that doesn't happen, we're going to regard that as an existential threat. Yeah, yeah, I, <clears throat> I, I feel that the, um, I mean, that's what I kind of mentioned in passing earlier, you know, the antinatalism as like a, almost a flip side of this kind of idea of hedonic bliss that the, uh, the, the, you know, a lot of the transhumanists are kind of invested in. Um, or like ending the hedonic treadmill. Um, I think, yeah, it like, it, you know, it, it, it has this uh, somewhat, you know, this uh, utilitarian uh, conception of value that collapses it into maximization. Um, and yeah, like, uh, I think in the final session, uh, we're going to talk a, a bit more about this. But, um, yeah, like I think collapsing meaning into maximalization is like a um, is a problem that's like quite rife. Uh, it's like a semantic issue, um, and it's quite rife, uh, and it leads to the you know these fears of uh, either hedonic bliss or like you know uh, rocco rocco torment and like you know yeah like you're right. There's like a return of uh, um, there's a return of that kind of theistic framework of like ultimate punishment, ultimate. Uh, reward um, and yeah I mean you know the, the historical parallels between Rocco and like Pascal's wager are like really obvious uh, like you know like just mind-blowingly obvious and <clears throat> as far as I'm aware like I mean I'm sure you know 
less wrong is a labyrinth, but like, you know, I'm sure there's like plenty of posts on this matter, but like, I don't think they really acknowledge it that much. But, um, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Bostrom directly acknowledges this in his account of Pascal's mugging. Have you heard uh, of this? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, can you explain it? Because uh, I forget what it actually is. But like, I mean, yeah, it's been a while since I've looked at it. But essentially, it's the idea that um, a guy comes to you. He's trying to mug you on the street. Um, he says, you know, uh, give me all your money. Give me a hundred dollars. Um, and so you say, well, you know, why, why would I do that? You don't have a weapon. You're, you have no way of, of uh, making me do this. And he's like, well, you know, if you give me $100 now, then in a month, I'll come back and I'll give you $1,000. Um, you're like, well, you know, why, why should I consider that? And as he increases the amount that he'll give until he's giving you, you know, millions or billions of dollars, it's like you ought to be more willing to, um, you know, accede to his requests. Um, but um, I can't remember, you know, the, the details of how he develops this, but that's basically the account. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Doesn't Negostani raise it uh, in Intelligence and Spirit at some point? Um, yeah, he, he, he has a, an interesting response. I, I think he's, he's mostly responding to, um, to Rodin on this sort of, like, um, the, the idea that there could be some singularity threshold of intelligence beyond which um, we cannot make sense of it. He's challenging that, and he's challenging a lot of the reasoning from these sorts of... Um, he, he's arguing against a, a, a dynamical systems account where uh, there is these sorts of uh, limits that are approached of, um, you know, uh, uh, beyond which we, you know, we can't make sense of, um, of, uh, of, what's, uh, of some process. But, um, I mean, like, one of the broader problems, I think, within this, this like, maximization account is the idea of, like, fixed utility scales, which um, we have no reason to suppose that there's something like um, a utility scale that's fixed even within my own head that could be compared to other people that, you know, uh, can be um, measured in, um, like, uh, as, as ratio data as opposed to, like, ordinal data. Um, so, that, like, there's a lot of problems with not even just with the notion of maximization, but with the notion of, like, units that could be maximized. So, um, I mean, that, that becomes another problem for if you're trying to present an account on which uh, we want to um, maximize utility or happiness or anything where we, we would presume that there's, like, some, some measurable data by which we could base such an account. It's like, no, I think we, we need some sort of... Um, normative basis, which is where like Brandon comes in and becomes useful, but that, that normative um, intersubjective or cognitive process cannot be uh, a current without this sort of like continual unfolding and responsiveness where we, we can't really make predictions about, you know, what, what will humans normatively want in the far future? What, you know, what would be the best action for like us a thousand generations from now? We have no possible idea of what we could want or what sort of agents we would be. We just don't know. Um, and so to presume that there's any sort of scale by which we could assess such a thing, I, I think that's also like illegitimate. So there's a lot of sort of prognostication based on current trends um, that's, that it's kind of like um, the, the Moore's law thing. Like well, now we know that Moore's law is kind of falling apart uh, due to basically just like thermodynamic limits of computation. But we had this idea that, oh, you know, computing power is just gonna increase exponentially and it's just gonna keep on doing that that's tapered off, um, but it was only like, it lasted like 50 years or something. Like it, there, there's, well, we were making an inference from this tiny span of time and assuming that it would hold for like all of history. On, on that note, what do you make of um, uh, Rodin's disconnection thesis? I, I used to object to it more than I do now. Um, I think there's, there's things to object to it insofar as intelligibility, I think, is sort of, it, it may be a necessary property of rational agents. I'm, I'm not sure how to construe that. It may, may also be the case that intelligibility would only take place within some particular community of rational agents. So I can imagine like the, some sort of disconnected alien species, which have like a strongly um, recognitive linguistic system uh, within which they can acknowledge each, each other and relate to each other, but wherein we like they're not intelligible to us because we have no sort of like um, basis for for relating to them or or sort of historical 
um, relationship, etiology, etc. Um, that's would be prone to the like the sort of uh, questions that you've got around like radical translation and um, in the tradition coming from like uh, Quine and Davidson and so on, which is what where Rodin's approaching it from. So I think it, it ends up being a question about um, like what language is and whether there's like um, some sort of mechanism of translatability that would um, enable us to um, communicate with any sorts of entities. But um, I, I think that at this stage, we don't really have um, any way of, of making sense of that except by assuming that if something is intelligent, we can communicate with it. We haven't um, failed in that so far that we know of, right? Like maybe yeah, there's, there's the possibility that uh, dolphins have some sort of like um, communicative system, which we're completely unaware of, you know? Like there, there may be all sorts of things that we're encountering that we just have have no sort of comprehension of um, that are radically dis uh, disconnected from us. But um, insofar as we can apprehend something as rational, I think it, it has to be prone to like recognitive apprehension. So it's almost as though there's no use in defining something as radically disconnected as as that being like different from like inert matter or like um, sentient rather than sapient life. Because uh, even if there there were some like complex recognitive normative system existing in, in um, another system of agents uh, and we could not communicate with it, then, then um, there's, there's no mechanism by which that would become like a useful way of assessing that, that community. It would just have to be treated as a natural phenomena in the same way that other natural phenomena are. Yeah, yeah. I'm, there's a, uh, a phenomenon that people that uh, like, um, is it ethnologists? Uh, people that study animal behavior, or is it ethology? I can't remember. But um, people that study, the people that work with dolphins have this thing that they call weirdness, which is like you get the feeling that there's some kind of recognitive system, like just outside our, our reach going on uh, the longer you work with them, which I think is quite interesting. But um, with the, um, uh, yeah, I mean, this is why the astrocognition idea I think is interesting, because it's like, you know, um, the paper, I'll, I'll find uh, I'll find the paper on it and uh, post it in the classroom. Um, <clears throat> but the, it had like an explicitly kind of Kantian title. It was like a propedeutic to astrocognition. Um, and so, yeah, I think like the similar kind of, you know, the uh, post-human possibility space, it, it also has this kind of, yeah, like, uh, you know, again, like astrobiological um, uh, way in which you can frame it as like, you know, are there, you know, and Kant spoke about aliens, of course, um, you know, he uh, he said he was willing to bet that there were uh, aliens, which is um, yeah, interesting. Again, talking about credence and uh, um, uh, and uh, kind of uh, you know degrees of belief, um, willing to bet. But yeah, so um, uh, yeah, like you know, if as Brandon says that you know norms are entrenched in tradition, then yeah, like where's the kind of recognitive cutoff point? Uh, you know, like. Does does that mean that we couldn't recognize, uh, it, it couldn't recognize and be recognized by beings with, uh, you know, entirely separate histories to us? Um, so yeah, I think that's an interesting <coughs> question. Um, but yeah, uh, so unless uh, does anyone have any 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 further comments uh, or um, uh, should we wrap up for today and continue next week? Just one other quick question, which is, do you have a PDF copy of Spinal Catastrophism? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do, actually. So I can, um, I mean, I, I, I should check with uh, Robin, but, like, obviously, I trust you guys not to, like, distribute or anything. Um, but, yeah, I can, uh, for anyone that's interested, I can, I can give you, uh, uh, I just finished the manuscript uh, on Monday, so... Yeah, so I mean, that's me being uh, in spinal catastrophism is me being incredibly naughty and irresponsible and like taking off my like, oh, we have to be responsible for the human race hat and putting on my uh, kind of, you know, like uh, slightly more impious uh, guys. So yeah, I mean, it's probably a lot more fun. But yeah, so I'll, I'll, if you're interested, just let me know and I'll, um, I'll uh, send you guys a copy. Uh, so yeah, I mean, unless if there's anything else, should we uh, wrap up for today? And um, uh, yeah, I, it's yeah, really great session. I'm really glad to have you have you all on board, and it's like a really robust discussion. 
And uh, yeah, I'm glad that, you know, there's um, loads of different ways of looking at these things coming out and um, especially the kind of critique of uh, the Bostromite worldview that's coming that's coming out. I think that's like a really interesting thing and I'm really excited to yeah see how see where all this goes. So yeah, um, thanks for being on board everyone. And, um, yeah, looking forward to next week. Thanks for an amazing session. Cheers, thanks for Peace. moderating. Peace guys. See you, everyone. Bye.